bussin' with the boys. Bro. There you go. There it is. All right, let's hit yeah. it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to... Are we rolling? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 250 of Bussin' with the boys. 250? We, 250? 250, let's go. baby. Drop comments. Every single day, just getting better and better for you people. And I, I like to I like to think that we've grown a lot, too. We have a great show for you today. Uh, a lot of chaos. A lot of chaos oh. in the college football landscape. Oh, and there's yeah. one team at the forefront of all of that, especially as we get into the late part of the season. Are we looking at uh, the college football playoff? What's going to happen there? Also, Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher, secured the bag, secured dropped the ball, the bag. decided to get the f*** out of... Bleep that. Decided to get the heck out of there. And also the NFL season, week 10 of the NFL season was incredible. Had an amazing time. Points flying everywhere. CJ Stroud once again. Yeah, once again gets it Damn. done. Lions handling business. Cleveland wins a nail biter. CJ Stroud, like you just said, runs the ball, gets the ball all the way down the field to hit a game winning field goal after Tyler Boyd dropped a touchdown pass to go up by dumber, more than three points. Dumberly question Can all four teams in the FC North make the playoff? <laughs> I'm sure time will tell, and we'll have the boys look it up. But before we get into all of that, we need to talk to you about the most durable, reliable vehicle on the market, and that is, let's give a round of applause for the Chevy Silverado, specifically the family of ZR2s. They have, I think they have a diesel coming out. They've got, uh, you've got this, you got the ZR2. You, that, they have a commercial that runs during during Sundays. Like that thing gets you going with yeah. those three Chevys back to back, the family climbing up the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like parlaying it with like white water rafting, just grit, determination. And it is, I have the ZR2, not to flex, but to also flex, but the Multimatic, the billion cameras, the mud terrain tires. Mm. You, I mean, you know how it is. You feel safe. You said it last week. There's you a level safe of safety. When you're in my truck. Yeah. Christmas season's here. All the best deals on all, all on the trucks. That's Chevy Silverado. They come out during the during the season. Tis the season. This is the reason. The Chevy Silverado, the ZR2. It is the best truck. Could you imagine snow on the ground, waking up to a pine smell? Santa Claus came, and you walk downstairs and you look at all the presents. Everyone's opening presents. You're like, well, where was my present? And you're and your significant other looks at you and says, go and look outside for your present. We'll and there's the a ZR2 Chevy Silverado waiting for you right there. Yes. One, you're, you're a new man for the rest of your life or a woman. Or, or whatever. Yeah, or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah, or whatever. we're open on this pod. Listen, um, that was a quick little intro for you guys. We are going to... Oh, and also, also, uh, uh, Steve-O. Steve-O interview. Oh, yeah, Steve-O. We get to release the Steve-O interview. A That's hero. A, That's a, a hero of mine, but another hero of this bus and to a lot of people down in San Francisco. We have uh, the legendary, the almighty, a record-setting, record-holding individual, Christian McCaffrey, on the show today. Let's get right into it. Wait, he didn't set a record. I thought he set the record, and then he and then the record's done now. No, no, he didn't set the record. He let the record. He let the entire country down. All of white culture riding on his shoulders. And let's get this record. Let's get in the record books. Not only did he, he let the record books down, but he also let the bus with the boys. Okay. So with that being said, let's get into the dude wipe <laughs> shittiest moment of the week for Christian McCaffrey. Uh, Christian, I thought you handled your press conference incredible, brother. Everybody scored but me. I suck a very good <laughs> rabbit from eight mile situation, brother. But there got to be some pain in there. And obviously, dude wipes, which is the segment because this is the, this is the shitty moment. Go ahead and use those things. Do you use dude wipes? I yeah. will now. Yeah, you he absolutely should. Dude wipes. You absolutely should. You seem like a healthy individual. That, that white little yeah. that wet stuff is good for you. Yeah, the only hassle would be just carrying them to the stall. Yeah. <laughs> like having to actually take them there, but worth it, I'd say. Yeah, they're com they're coming out with ones that just attach to your skin, so you have like a whole pack just waiting on your side at all times. They're they're in the they're working that through right now. But let's, okay. let's talk about yesterday's game. Dominant performance by the 49ers. Everyone is literally saying, "Here we go, Christian McCaffrey again. First drive, probably gonna get a touchdown, and it ends up not happening for you." At what point did you start to worry? <laughs> Yeah, one uh, to ten. How pissed off were you after that ass open in the locker room that you didn't want to talk to anybody because you did not get the record? <laughs> hey, congrats, congrats, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah. Man, don't fucking talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, walk us through. I, I tied the record, so technically, you know, it's not like I'm two. Yeah, you're tied well, for one. You're, uh, yeah, you know how that is. Though. You want that standalone name? Like, I'm sure leading no, up to the week. You want that name? I'm sure leading no, up to the uh, week. Yeah, ahead. I mean, it's it's funny because. 
honestly, I thought I was going to be more upset than I was, but I think when you <laughs> win like that and it was good to kind of get the run game going again against a good run defense too, that had the stats to prove it. Um, so I was, I was pretty excited after the game. Um, I thought I was going to be way more like pissed off than I was, but I, I really wasn't that mad at all other than letting Will down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you did, you had a, you had a hell of a performance. And I know like you guys to drop three, we'll get to that in a minute. And so it was a big bounce back week for the boys getting healthy in the bye week and everything else. So, and on top of that, I'm sure there was some creativity of, you know, Hey, let's get CMC in the end zone. Like, let's get the record, but you're not going to put that above, like obviously whooping a team's ass. If right. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Um, but uh, yeah, there's probably a little bit of that. Damn. Cause there was one where you guys were in the red zone, right? And you caught a screen. Was it a screen? You caught something. I was like, okay, let's get busy. Let's get in there. Hey, and you, kid. and you almost broke one. Maybe it was just a simple running play, but you almost got out and got tripped. I was like, damn it. That was going to be it, dude. That's what hurts is that what hurts is that there wasn't, there was a couple plays that you just wanted back that oh. it was like, damn, if I had just done this, that was the play. And it wasn't that, you know, the last drive where they were trying to feed me um, and try to, by the way, that's pretty, pretty cool that, you know, you're in a game like that and your coaches are trying to get you that. Like, I don't know. I, I, that goes a long way for me. So I'm, I'm, I appreciated that. Um, but it was in like the second quarter and first quarter where you're like, God, dude, if I just didn't do this, that was it. We could have got it Man. out of the way early. And I didn't. When you look back on the tape, that's that's what hurts. It'd be one thing if there was like, ah, oh, there just really wasn't a lot of opportunities, but there was, and I think that's what stings. Especially getting Trent Williams back and being like, okay, yo, we're really moving at full force now. I got the big yeah. dog at left tackle now. Uh, what did Shanahan say to you after the game? Because there was like a, boys, we did it. We got the monkey off our <laughs> back. We won after losing three. Let's go. Have a day, boys. Have a day. And there had to be like a, a calming you just get it out of the shower. You probably got the towel on. You're looking in your, at your stuff, probably having a moment of being like, damn. <laughs> and I'm sure Shanahan comes up to you. What does he say to you? Uh, and the, actually, like when he addressed the team, it was funny because he called Juice out. He, he Juice had caught that touchdown. Um, we ran like a keeper and Juice has, you know, I think he's, he's the second to last read and no one covered him. <laughs> and... Brock threw a dot, like a 35 yard touchdown pass to him. And he caught it. Juice caught it at the one and scored. And uh, so everyone was just making fun of Juice's selfishness of not <laughs> kneeing it at the one. <laughs> to try and get the boy in. That's Obviously you know. joking. There's people, there's people on the internet who are like, I've made a joke about it. And they're like, oh, since when did you care about like, so I'm like, obviously I want yeah. Juice or I'm joking. But yeah. um no, that that was just funny. We all just started making fun of Juice instead, and how selfish he is as a as a teammate and player. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Uh, never guy never felt so bad about scoring six in his entire I know, life. Dude. I know. You yeah. bring up you bring up somebody. You said Brock Purdy threw a dime. I don't know if you've heard some news reports, but there are people saying Brock Purdy's not the guy. Do you think this was? A yeah, no, I heard that from an anonymous source. Yeah, um, I didn't really hear that from you know a relevant source. Yes. So. Yeah, that. Okay, I see what you did there, and that's understandable. What uh, what about this game? Are you able to say to those people that said that, not your boys, they were just giving out the message? Well, that's like a f you. So you see what he did today. Well, first off, I mean, can we address it? Yeah. Oh, bro, that's we're, we're that's, boys. Yeah, this we're is boys. Awesome with the boys, if you got to hold some boys accountable, go ahead and do that. You have the floor, Taylor. Yes, sir. Anonymous <laughs> reporting. God, I swear to God, I swear to God, it's not my opinion. Hey, that's what he's saying. He's saying anonymous reporting. Yeah, he's but what, you're what, the you know, what it, Will knows who my source is. I, is this TMZ? Dog, this is oh! TMZ, dude. What yeah, are we football doing? TMZ, listen. I have, this last game, I mean, you can, you can see what Brock Purdy's done, but you, I mean, look at the last, you know, we're talking since he's gotten in the, in the ball game. I don't disagree. The guy's been a stud. He's been balling. Right. And, and I don't know all the stats, but he's got the stats to, to, to show it. The QBR, the completion percentage, the completion under pressure, all that. Guy's done nothing but ball out. Right, right. And I, listen, if you look back, being the avid fan of Bustin' with the Boys that you are, back in January, February, March, I talked about this anonymous source. You remember that, correct? 
You remember talking? You know who the anonymous source hey, is. Hey, brother, this is this is, you're, this is, this you're is right. your battle. God forbid you got to lean on friends. You, I, I literally <laughs> said this back in March, and then I left it alone. I let it ride. And then after the three games happened, Brock did have a couple of tough two-minute drills where there were some open guys. He kind of throws it in the safety's belly. Where I go to bring back up, my anonymous source said this, and he also doubled down in a text after your second the second loss, not the third but one. That's, to me, that's it's too easy. It's too easy to just wait. I mean, you had to wait a long time to drop that. I mean, Brock's played, I don't know calling. how many games. He's been phenomenal. It's too easy to wait till like, maybe, first off, there's always more that goes into it. Like, I know for me, there's been times where I, I might have been off on the timing that leads to a pick or like, guy's not in the right spot. Leads to a pick. And Brock's always going to put it on his shoulders. That's the kind of guy he is. But it's just too easy to wait till someone fails to be like, not I told you so, anonymous source told you so. Right, because I'm a, I'm a supporter of the 49ers. How many times have I not told you? Have I not it's told convenient. Kittle? Have I it's not convenient told reporting. Fred it's Warner that you guys have the best locker room in all of the NFL? And I wish I was able to play for a team like the 49ers. Like that. We had a great locker room at the, uh, at the Titans, but I have given you guys so many flowers. And I can see, and I'm happy I was able to give you guys that bulletin board material to go play the Jags. And I feel like I was a part of that win. And I do understand where you're coming from. <laughs> However, I have to lean back on the fact that it truly was an anonymous source. And because of he wasn't playing great, and he texted me and said, see, now there's a big enough sample size where you can beat Brock Purdy. And I was like, all right, well, I guess this is where I go and I, I tell this is what I was told. But I, but I see where you're coming from, brother. I see it. I okay. understand it. Because if hey, I was, as long if, as you see, yes, as long as you see where I'm coming if from. If I was in your shoes, I'd be doing the same thing. And I think you've handled this well yeah. too. Of essentially telling yeah. me fuck you without saying fuck you. <laughs> I think that was that was great. Go Niners. Yeah. Am I right? Hey, I'll yeah. tell you, I'll tell you what though, uh, what I love to see is uh when he was under duress and that pocket was collapsing on him and he did deliver a dot to George Kittle. And that is a big time throw that you get fired up for when the, you know, when we, we allude back to the Baltimore board material and and uh, people kind of talking about okay they've dropped three is Brock Purdy is he not the guy yada 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 that was uh that was awesome to see because you guys did it was uh you guys got healthy and what people don't understand too is that bye week was big for yourself you've been a little banged up the last few weeks even though you haven't been uh inactive like Debo and Trent but you get the whole train back the machine is back and you guys are out there you know beating ass that that has to that has to feel good when that was going on yesterday at Jacksonville yeah, hundred percent. I think the bye, bye weeks are much needed, uh, especially in the kind of that middle middle of the year, because you play eight or whatever games in a row. But you also had training camp too, so it the accumulation of you know wear and tear starts to. And I don't even know if it's physically because I think by the time week eight turn you know hits, your body's pretty callous to it. It's more just you need to get away for a little bit and rest. Um, so I think it was huge. I think for us, you know, it's about just keeping the foot on the gas and not slowing down. Um, you know, even in that game, and obviously I'm always going to say this after every week, but I think it's true. And I'm not just trying to be that guy, but I really do believe there's always things you can get better at. And there's things in that game that can make or break the momentum of the entire game. It, you know, that's a really good team with a really good defense who have the numbers to back it up. And, um, it's a game for a long time. A couple plays here and there go our way, um, but we can still get better. And we, that's really the way we have to approach it is just continuing to get better every single week and not letting the score kind of dictate the way we feel. Obviously wins feel good, but you know, Kyle always talks about just going off of the tape. What does the tape look like? You want that tape to look good because you can win. And then you look at the tape, you're like, damn, we could have been a lot better. And then, you know, obviously you're still happy, but, you know, the way you look at a win, the way you look at a loss should be similar other than the um, the feeling you get, the emotional feeling you get when you win. And looking at it with a critical eye, you brought up bye weeks. Now, there's always that conversation when the everyone gets all excited about what the schedule is when it goes out to the media. But players usually talk about that bye week. And a lot of times it's like, bro, we got a week four bye this year. That sucks. To you, Christian McCaffrey, what is like the best week to have a bye week for you? Is it right around the time you did or you want a little bit later? I think, yeah, I think eight, like right in the midway point is great. Um, the early buy is tough. Brutal. The late buy is tough. Um, 
but I think that that middle of the pack, yeah, I thought our bye was at a, at a great time, kind of perfect timing for us. What'd you do for the bye week? I went home to uh, Denver, saw my family. I actually, I won a fly fishing tournament. Oh, oh let's go, boy, man. Yeah. Let's go. There was only th- there's only three of us doing it, but I still won. So, Got a trophy and everything. Let's go. Podium no matter what. That is the awesome. way the Podium. Job. Podium. Can you talk about how important it is uh, to get away? Because a lot of times, like, you know, I saw George, I believe he went to Montana. He went to somewhere nice. Um, I forget a couple of weeks ago, somebody, I think, believe went on a bye week and you see fans every now and then talk about, oh, why are you going on a, why are you doing this on a bye week? Like you should be self-scouting, yada, yada. Can you talk about how important it is to get away from the facility, to get away from football uh, from your perspective? Yeah, the, you know, there's really only one speed that you go in the NFL and that's, that's all out. It's full speed all the time. You from, you know, physically, emotionally, and mentally, it's all day, every day and your life and everyone else life depends on it. And the life, I say that not as an actual life, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, because of that, you, you, you'll burn out. If you go that hard 365 days a year, you will burn out and you need to get away for a little bit more mentally and emotionally just to recharge your batteries and get back. I think it's extremely critical. I, I, when I used to train when I was a younger player in the league, my first couple of years, you know, the season would end and I would, I would start training pretty quickly um, after the season ended. And I just remember being a little bit burnt out by the time like week six came around. And it wasn't like I changed it all. Like it didn't, changed my process. It didn't change anything. I just felt like, damn, I've been doing this for a long time and didn't give myself the respect that I needed to take a couple, you know, more meant just mental breaks, you know, whether it's go, go get on the beach somewhere and just rejuvenate, um, get back so that when you do come back, you're ready to go all out again. It's really hard to just constantly go a hundred percent all the time for your body, for your mind, for everything. That's an interesting thing you bring up because that is a a massive conversation between football players all the time is when do you start training in the off season and during the bye week what do you do? Something we talked about back in August is when you finally make the decision is like, all right, I'm going to take the bye week a little lighter than I've did in years past. When did you start to to work that out? And then how did you handle kind of like maybe the anxiety bug in your head being like, hey, you're not doing enough. Hey, you should be you should be working out. You shouldn't be fly fishing just dusting these two other guys in this tournament right now. (laughs) Like what, like what allowed you to kind of make peace with the fact that this is good for me to do when a lot of it's, you're just so bred to be work, work, work all the time. Yeah. It's, it's, that's a great question. Cause it's the hardest question even to this day for myself to answer. And I don't know if there's a concrete answer. It really depends. It depends on how you're feeling. It depends on kind of what you're going through. Um, body wise, like, do I need, like, you know, if you're all banged up and you have some stuff lingering and going on then you probably should stay and grind so that you can get back to normal. Um, but if you're pretty healthy and everything's going well, and you you know, that like a couple days of rest can take care of this, then, you know, I think it's important to do that. Um, but it's really a daily ev- evaluation. I always try to move during the bye week like do some sort of movement, like you can't just sit there all day. Um, but it really depends. Like for me, I just needed to rest. I needed to sleep. I felt like sleep was the biggest thing for me because I'm going to get my treatment. I'm going to do my workouts, but I need to sleep in. I need to go to bed early. I need to just, uh, let my body recover naturally as much as possible. And then, uh, when you get back to the week, then you get back to the, you know, the football schedule, but you can't, you can't not move, but you can also overdo it. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure that that Monday, when you come back, you feel like, okay, I, I could have played on Sunday this week, but I didn't. And that's why I'll feel better the next week. I love that. If we back up before the bye week in Jacksonville, what was kind of the urgency level in the locker room around the building after dropping three? It was huge. You know, that it was such a weird taste in our mouth, I think, after you lose three going into a bye week because normally you want to go, there's nothing like winning going into the bye week. You feel yes, good. You're, yes. And I think that, that was, I don't want to say good. Losing's never good. But I think when we came back, everyone had a sense of urgency that was, you know, we can't, this is a tough league. It's, it's tough to win. It's tough to 
play well all the time. It's tough to beat teams in the NFL. Everyone's good. You know, I've heard people talk about our roster and our roster is amazing. I love it. Everyone's roster is good though. There's teams all over the place that have really good rosters and, um, it's about executing properly. And to do that, you got to work really hard on and off the field. And so there was definitely a huge sense of urgency for our team to get back at it. And still is, I don't think that's changed at all. You bring up your roster and you guys, uh, during the trade deadline, got an absolute stud to be on the other side of Nick Bosa. I know he's a stud. I know he's going to play well for you guys. How is he fitting into the locker room? How did he come in there? And it, what kind of guy is Chase Young? He's been great. Uh, he's been awesome. I mean, I think, you know, when I know exactly what he's going through right now, and when you go into a team like this, one of the beauties of it is, you know, you, all you have to do is be yourself. And um, I think he sees that and he's done that. He's fit in great. Um, obviously played extremely well yesterday and we're excited to have him. But no, he's been a great locker room guy already. And um, he's been himself and practices hard, works hard. And, um, you know, hopefully he's got a revamped sense of energy coming to our team. Dude, if you're in the NFC West and you're a tackle and you see that trade happen, you're just like, fuck, man, are we kidding? Yeah, we got to deal that trade, with that have, shit. Especially like with the Niners back end, like their defense showed up because there's been question marks outside of their four walls about their defense, especially pass defense. And now you bring in Chase Young. You got guys who you can kind of pin your ears back more with four-man rushes than trying to get creative with blitzing so you get that extra guy. Like I'm sure, you know, as much as those – tackles hate it like i'm sure the the back seven was relieved like hey mm -hmm. we can play some more cover Thank we can God. do more this we can do more that uh yeah man i think he'll do i think he'll do well out there one question i have for you what is christian mccaffrey's guilty pleasure during the season is there a tv show is there something you do at the end of the week is it a restaurant is it food like what is christian mccaffrey's little guilty pleasure where he's like you know what i'm checking out for about yeah, when are you getting naughty yeah yeah when you get naughty <laughs> um you know i i like uh i love like i mean we talked about the snacks on the plane that's something i've always looked forward to um because i i'll eat you know the cookie i'll eat everything on that plane um i don't know if anyone else is the same as me when it comes to this but i'm always looking for new shows and new movies and i just watch the office and I, it's like, I want to get into a new show and I've seen the office five times, but I just like, it's so much easier to just throw the office on than start a new show. And I'm not sure if anyone else is like me in that, but it's hard for me to get into a new show during the season or anything like that. So I, my guilty pleasure would be just throwing the office on and kind of just relaxing. Yeah, I feel like there's a level of when you start a new show, you're like, I really got to pay attention to pick up on the things pick up on the reasons why people said, Hey, you need to go watch this show. Yeah. When you put on like a, an office or parks and recreation, those ones that are just yeah. like funny. You can keep them moving. If you miss 15 minutes of it, it's not going to change the plot or anything like that. That is always a nice little deal. And also to go with that, uh, like having to concentrate. But once you buy into a new show, there's part of you that you'll look at the clock. Like if it's eight 45 and you got an hour in the next show and you're like, okay, I can probably get in bed and hopefully asleep by 10 p.m., but then it goes into 10.30. It's 10.38 when you're checking your clock to where you're like, I knew I shouldn't have watched that one more episode. Dog, like when you're so bought real. in, like when you're, when you are getting pulled into that show, sucked in, like it's, you almost, no, no pause. You almost <laughs> like, you start to compromise a little bit. Like, let me get an extra one here. Okay, right. I'll sleep six hours instead of seven because you want to watch it. Like they left me on a nice cliffhanger. So it's yeah. probably smart that you do that. That That is very smart. What, yeah. did, what did you have on the on the ride back from uh, Jacksonville? Um, I had the Boom Chicka Pop. Smart. By the way, shout out Boom Chicka Pop. They sent a bunch of uh, popcorn to the locker room. Let's go. So oh, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks to the boys for giving me the platform. <laughs> and um boom chicka pop business is open. Yep. The the EQ guys, we all uh indulged in it, so it was great. Um I also that's the other thing. I I'll play I'll play a little bit of Fortnite. I feel like I'm the longest tenured Fortnite player in the NFL. I started playing when the game came out and I haven't played another game since. It's the only game I'll play. Really? And I've gone through like four or five different rosters of guys. So my Mondays and Tuesdays, when I have some time off, I'll kick back in the chair and play the game for sure. Ooh, and then like, uh, I've never been, I was more of a PUBG guy versus Fortnite, but uh, didn't Fortnite just like go back to like an original map or something like that? Yeah, the OG map is back. 
<clears throat> they got different games. You know, you, know, you ever play Call of Duty too? That you remember Gun Game in the town? Oh so yeah. They have that now. You can play that with Fortnite guns, like no build. There's a bunch of you know. So I I'll get on with my high school buddies and uh, we'll play that, which is fun. That's probably my guilty pleasure of the week. Is that a first? You're a big first person shooter guy. Like, hey, we're playing with a bunch of people, or do you like a good storyline when it comes to your video games? Also, and the storyline doesn't do it for me. Damn. I. I'm not going to play by myself either. I like how, like if my buddies are on, I'll play. Um, cause it's more about the camaraderie for me and just a little bit of competition. That's kind of unconscious. You can sit back and do whatever. Um, but I, I never got into the storyline. I think like the last storyline game I played was probably halo three way back in the day. Still a great game. Uh, it was a great game, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, no, it's more first person. If you want something that's less uh, stressful on the eyes and the reaction time, we got a nice little thing going with a game called Risk. It's a board game. We play it on the Xbox Live. And it that would be time. a great addition to try really? to... Really? Yes, dude. It is so much fun. Because everyone just making strategical moves and you're like texting people on the side. Like, I'm going to do this. You got to go do this. He's getting too powerful. Oh, and guys are just talking shit the whole time. Guys back arguing and forth. out loud. You're literally playing the game for like four or five hours. It's definitely an off-season game, but I think you would be a phenomenal addition. Yeah, hey, I, would, for a lo night or I two. would love to join. That's a good I'd time. You got anything else for the boy? Uh, I, I think last time we talked about after the tear talk, we were getting into some ice cream. <laughs> Is that a subject that you have some expertise in where you got a ranking? You have a little ranking system for your top three? I see you clearing your throat. Like, this might be your moment. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call myself an expert, just speaking honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I like what I like, and I'm, I'm standard when it comes to ice creams. You're not going to enjoy my evaluation, but I can give it to you. I would love to hear it. This is gonna make He's you sick. Deep. I could just see. I could see. Have you ever seen that uh, that uh, video on Instagram of the guys who grab the spoon and he, he's like showing you how you taste ice cream? Yeah, I can see. I feel like Chris is doing that in his, in his head right now. Yeah, he no. This will good. make you sick because my my rankings aren't. It, anyway, number one. Oh, for me, start at the top. And yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe I'll start three. Number three is mint chocolate chip. Number two is anything Oreo, cookies and cream. And my number one is haagen vanilla ice cream. Yep. <laughs> I'm, boys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. That... I apologize. and uh, <laughs> But that's what it is. I'm not going to sit here and lie on on the bus. Do you want to know you something? Know, that was worse than watching the first half of that game, like uh, Raiders <laughs> Jets. Like that's just worse. That's as bad as watching an Iowa football game right there. <laughs> You're, this is not, this is actually not a joke. If you were to flip your picks, you have the same exact palette as my six-year-old daughter. Yeah. It's mint yeah, chocolate your daughter chip, has a great palette. Oreo, and vanilla. Now I've, I mess mint chocolate chip is just, it always blows my mind when people are like, yeah, I mess with mint chocolate chip. I just, I, I let me explain bad. the mint chocolate chip though, because I I used to agree with you on that. What, I would I would laugh when someone would bring up mint chocolate chip, but to me, it's the you could eat the whole thing and feel good. Like whatever whatever ones you guys are probably gonna say, you're three bites and you have a stomach ache, right? Like it depends. I mean, I can I get to the bottom and then it takes probably twenty minutes for it to kick in. Yeah, but yeah, then you're hurting. Yeah, if I'm on some vitamins, I can put down like a pint and a half before I try to say like, hey, well, you got to stop. Yeah, we like, were, like we were, three prebiotics before to convince yourself like, oh, no this doubt. Is I'll throw, hey, hey, I'll throw in if I, I had P.F. Chang's last night and I gave myself three digestive enzymes thinking like, oh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I'm good. This is gonna I'm gonna I had the enzymes. Right I'm, I'm completely fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that is the logic, though. Yeah, we were in we were at Barstool HQ and. <laughs> Big Cat orders. What's the spot he orders the milkshakes for to make it special? Um, Portillo's. Portillo's. He orders milkshakes from Portillo's. And these, we're talking about guzzlers. We're talking about big gulps. You get the 7-Eleven size. Yeah, like 64 ounce yeah. cups. And Willie's like, hey, have you had Jenny's ice cream? Have you had gooey butter cake? And a couple guys did, a couple guys didn't. So Will also orders that. I drink an entire 64 ounce <laughs> vanilla shake. And then the gooey butter cake got there. And I'm like, I'm going to have a couple bites. Yeah. I ate a whole damn pint of that too. 
For me, it's, it's not the stomach, dude. I feel like my lower extremities, I can like legit feel them. Like I feel like I could tear anything yep. at any moment. But your thing with mint chocolate chip is like you feel you feel just as light. You don't feel as bad. It's a refresher to me. Yeah, it's a refresher. Wait, is that what and you and every want? bite, is that what you, you want this out of your is ice the thing cream? I like about it because I've always had a critique on mint chocolate chip is that they don't you don't get enough chocolate chip in it. Yes. And so you're always waiting for that next bite, but that's part of what keeps you in the game is, you know, if you're unconsciously scooping, you're eating, you're like, man, I wish there was a chocolate chip in that bite. All you're thinking about is the next bite. Like when I have the ooey gooey, whatever, the butter cake. You have that, by the way, you've had that on the first bite. Every bite's the same. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm good. Dude, to me, it's that's like, holy shit, I get an entire pint of this flavor in my mouth because i'm one of those guys i eat faster because like as it, as it's gone in my mouth i need to taste back in so i'm <laughs> always exa- yeah you know what That's i mean and so like a genie's you let it sit for just a little bit so you can start getting the little the little melted edges and then that is when you know you're playing with house money because yeah. to me the gooey butter cake and like the high five candy bar from jenny's dairy queen i mean I, i'm a big chocolate candy guy Dude, if that's loaded up and you know some, some, it's all the way down to the bottom, like to me, that's, that's, it's like, do you want to feel refreshed after eating ice cream? And no. to me, my answer is no. If that's how we eat ice cream, yeah. then I don't want to be right. As an adult, the way. I, and hey, I, I actually, that's a good point. And I understand that. Maybe in a different stage of my life, maybe I, I changed my mind just right now where I'm at. I like the classics. The other thing too. Yeah, just a vanilla. There's so much very... pressure. I don't there's so pick. much pressure when you go to like an ice cream store and order because there's 10,000 flavors. And you're like, I'm not going to buy five pints of different ones. Well, you could, but I know what's consistent and I know what I'm going to enjoy. Like if I order cookies and cream, if I'm going to an ice cream, you know, little local shop and they have cookies and cream, that's what I'm going to get because I know I'm going to enjoy it. But if I get like chocolate fudge brownie with something, I'm like, you're it's 50 50 whether or not I'm even going to like this. And it's 20 80 whether or not it's I'm going to like it more than cookies and cream. So my that's why I stick to the classics, because I I know for a fact I'll enjoy it. And that's good enough for me. That I'm is, not a risk taker at the at the ice cream stand. It's a good that's a all great point. Yeah, it's a veteran. I feel like that is a veteran savvy move because I can get caught window shopping for sure. And I'll still eat the whole thing and I'll be like, oh, I would have liked, you know, what I yeah. knew I loved before this. Cause I am I'm like, oh, that thing sounds good. Yeah. And I'm like you in that way. Sometimes you see one you like, but there's that other one that you're like, man, maybe I should get that. And then one of your buddies or your wife gets that one. And then you have a couple bites of yours and they're like, hey, do you want to try? And you obviously do try. And then that one's better. Yeah. And now all of a sudden the plate you're at is, it's worthless to you. Yeah. That's why, that's why I'll do, he kind of alluded to it, but I will, I'll buy a couple. I'll buy a couple and figure out yeah. if, if this is really worth the flavor, I'll eat it. And then I'll save my, one of my, uh, you know, OG favorites at home. Uh, and then if I don't like it, just toss it and we'll get back to business. I feel like as an adult, when you get into your thirties, like the idea of having ice cream, it's a, you have to, you have to get amped up. Like you're the boy, you're at the boy's house. You're hanging out, having a good time. You're like, yo, do you want some Dairy Queen ice cream? You're like, fuck yes, I want some Dairy Queen ice cream. And you're gonna go off. That's not the time to get your vanillas, your mint chocolate chips, or your yeah. your Oreos, even though an Oreo Blizzard does hit. But that's Oreo. the time to Oreo get a little. A yeah, you get a little wallet. Yeah, obviously, I want the large. Can they put yeah. an extra squirt of uh, car- caramel in that thing? Like that's when you get a little wild. You know, if you're sitting to the side having like after your nice little dinner on a Thursday night and have one scoop of vanilla ice cream, you might be a serial killer. That is, that's a crazy <laughs> move. That's a crazy move as an adult. I know. Dude. But it's haagen specifically. The haagen is the best. I'll feel, I'll feel, this is what'll happen though. And cause I understand what you're saying and it's a, it's great. It's a great point, but I'll feel, Oh, you know, like I'm, I'm going to venture off and do something crazy. I'll, I'll order a strawberry. Cause sometimes that strawberry is intriguing. You're like, I'm going for, and maybe it's maybe it's the mood you're in. Like, I don't want anything heavy. And as soon as I take that bite of strawberry, instant regret. As soon as I take any any other bite other than vanilla or Oreo, it's instant regret because I'm comparing it to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why I like, you know, I respect the places where you can add your own toppings because every time I get vanilla and I add Oreos. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want the gummy worms and I don't want that in my ice cream. I don't want... Even sprinkles, I've never been a sprinkle. They, they, do do they don't do anything. For no, me. I was with you with the worms. You lost me on the sprinkles because I personally. Oh, you're my, a sprinkle guy. My favorite combination is uh, vanilla ice cream, 
with caramel and sprinkles. I think that is just an absolute staple that to me is probably the best combination you can possibly have. That's nope. why. I, that's why I said I don't. I don't hate his vanilla take. The, the 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 caramel. It's not. <laughs> you just said vanilla say caramel caramel? And sprinkles. Yeah, rainbow sprinkles, not the chocolate ones, the rainbow ones. You, you are a fruitcake man, bro. Don't. <laughs> bro, you put a little extra on there, it adds texture. Dog sprinkles. That is insane. Yeah. Uh, no, I see. I, why every time we talk about <laughs> treats or snacks that I have to be the the, the odd man out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, sprinkles is a move on ice cream. It's a move. No, Dude. it takes away. It takes all of. It takes away what ice cream is. I don't like my ice cream. Shouldn't be. They shouldn't have sprinkles on. No, it, have you like, ever had a spr- this is the thing. You put Oreos on ice cream. It makes sense because you're like, I could have an Oreo plain and it's going to taste good. Yeah. When do you eat sprinkles? Like, when are you eating? Sprinkles plain. You would never do that. That's a, that's, so why would you do it? Argument. No, it's not. Well, when you when you have a cheeseburger and you put ketchup on it, if you were to eat ketchup by itself, you'd be like, I want to eat this. It's the same thing as you're saying to the sprinkles. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's the same analogy you just used. Hang on. What, what else? What else? No, because you can hang put on, ketchup. You can put ketchup, ketchup on a lot of hundred and fifty yeah. different okay. things. You can put ketchup on a million things. Sprinkles. You're dealing with. One, one category ice cream a milkshake ice cream and, a, and a sugar cookie or something like that like yeah. a frosted cookie yeah. and by the way i don't even want, i don't want the sprinkles on the sugar cookie either um, yeah, uh, I yeah. Sugar cookie. sprinkles is kind of just like that annoying rain that's like it's not heavy enough to be like you know hey it's storming outside it's I just kind of hitting you and you're just like god why is it raining what a waste of a day i could not disagree with either of you more i think sprinkles is a it's not a it's my favorite topping on with vanilla ice cream and caramel, that combination. And it's a, it's a unique little thing. It's like your pumpkin spice lattes. It's, you just, it's not for all the time. It's for in those moments. You said it's your favorite. It's my favorite combination. If you have vanilla ice cream. Yeah, we heard it. Caramel. French, French vanilla, caramel, and sprinkles. You put those three together, you're living. You're living the dream. Yeah. That is, that to me is, is a move. O- Oreos are great. <laughs> Oreos are great. But. It's essentially you said the same thing. You you did the same thing with Oreos as I did with ketchup and a burger. And I know that ketchup's a more versatile condiment. However, all right, mustard. Still a more versatile thing, but it's gonna make your sandwich better, but you're not gonna eat mustard by itself. You're playing and you're playing with an old ball. You're playing with <laughs> on com- two completely different fields here. Yeah. Because that's, that's all right. Yeah. No, yeah, that is your, yeah. I, that's again, that's your truth. That oh, is yeah. your truth for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> popcorn. <laughs> oh, now we're talking uh, popcorn. Yeah. We, hey, we're never going to go out to eat together, the three of us. <laughs> well, no, we, I think that, I think that's why we have to. Yeah. We're going to get ice cream the next time we see each other. <laughs> yeah. Christian and I kind of yeah, order next, some similar time, and then we're like, Taylor, what are you getting? <laughs> I'm going to come out to Nashville in the off season and we're going to get 30 different ice creams. We're going to put them down yeah. and we're going to taste test all of them. Taste That's what yeah. we're gonna do. And we got to cover the label. So we have no idea what flavor it is. Yeah. And we'll rank Perfect. them. That'd Perfect. That'd be fun. Hey, gooey butter cake coming out top. I know it's going to come out top three. No doubt. You I know actually gooey did butter that with my over this off season. I did that same thing. We did a big um, taste test for all these ice creams and vanilla wasn't included and cookies and cream wasn't included. And I, I can't remember what finished top, but maybe next time I'll come back and I, I think I have it on video. I'll remember what which one won because probably, probably if you want a more sophisticated answer, then I can give you whatever yeah. whatever flavor won that day. Yeah, 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 we'll definitely we'll definitely do that. That's 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 right up our alley. Yeah, no, we're a big a big ice cream boys. Do what? Yeah, that's a oh, great, yeah. that's a good time. Take that a couple, is a take really a couple good time. vitamins. Yeah, play some risk after. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll have, we'll have a time. Yeah. Um, are we solid? Seems like, hey, CMC, thank you for giving us, gifting us your time, bro. Uh, we really were. We were rooting for you hardcore. I was yelling at my TV because I had you in a parlay. Um, <laughs> I had you in a parlay. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was feeling it with you, but yeah, fired up for you, bro. 16 games, a, t- uh, a touchdown streak. That is that is awesome. 18. 18, 18. my fault. 18. 18. 18. Yeah. 18. What? Tied a record. Tied a record in the NFL. Yeah, His yeah. name will be etched in history forever. We're, we're gonna keep we're gonna end this on a great note. We're not gonna bring up last week and what happened between the three of us last week. We'll talk about that at a different time because it's been such high vibes. But we appreciate you coming on. Make sure you tell Brock I said hello and I'm rooting for him. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I appreciate you guys always, man. All right, brother. We'll see you. You're the man, bro. Every time. Every time.
Uh, that he's good at the list stuff. The, it's, and his, his logic in it is great too. When he goes, uh, he's like, he kind of sets it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of sitting there like, uh, I can do a list like I'm not an expert, but I'll give it to you if you want me to. Kind of like set it up like, you know, yeah, give it to us. And he's like, all right. And then he kind of just pauses. <laughs> Looks down because he knew that vanilla at the top was going to really throw a lot of people through. Yeah. But I, 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 if I was to pick between the core three of strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate, I would pick, I would pick vanilla, which I know I'm, I'm an outlier on that. Uh, yeah. To me, I can go now. Strawberry is a third for me, unless we're talking milkshakes. I think a smooth, like uh, a strawberry milkshake is solid. But to me, picking the three out of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, it's kind of like, you know, which Pokemon am I going to start with? It doesn't really matter. Like, I can, I can, you, we can win with all of them. I loved that. I you know love I mean? that analogy. I loved that. Yeah. Every, the way you explained <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Like, Pokemon, Pokemon's been a big uh, category for us. Yeah. Yeah. This weekend. Really just twice. It was uh, the name game and now now. Yeah. Yeah. But it still, it rings true. Joy. I mean, we grew up on Pokemon, man. Man, if you guys, if, uh, that was a true locker room hangout session. It was. Yeah. And that's, was. that's why you come here, boys. That's why you come to the show. Uh, obviously McCaffrey just played. We have Steve-O coming on. We're going to rip some ads for you guys. We're going to do good, bad, the ugly. We're going to do our twisted question of the week. Any, is there anything else that we're going to do? Because I feel like... Nope. Twisted question. You did shittiest moment. Direct take also. Direct take. That's it. Let's, um... Do you want to do our good, bad, the ugly, or do you want to do twisted, twisted question first? Let's go twisted question brought to us by uh brought to us by Twisted T. Um perfect for pool parties, college mm. game days. Keep it twisted with the boys. We were just out in um LSU over the weekend and that was a great vibe. A lot of Twisted Queens, a lot of t Twisted Kings were spreading the good news. We we're taking photos, we we're handing out merch. Grab a refreshing Twisted Tea today and this twisted question is brought to us by our boy Mitchie in the back. Mitch, what do you have for our twisted question, bro? All right, our twisted question this week it's Pretty cut and dry. Would you rather be blind or be deaf? I always hate the negative ones. I know. Yeah, like mm. these are always, you yeah, know, they've been some lose lose. Yeah, but yeah. short short answer for me is deaf. Yeah, I think deaf too. So I, I so well. I saw something on Twitter about this one, and uh, like a friend asked one of their blind friends, like, if you could be, which one would you rather be? And she said that she'd rather be blind because being deaf is so lonely, because you can't really. Like, you just, you're not hearing anything all the time. Whereas, like, being blind, like, you can still have conversations with people and, like, still connect with them. But, blind, like, being deaf, like, you can't, you're just, so, you're just kind of alone in silence your entire life. Fair. That's a good point. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. And that movie, uh, uh, Ray, from Ray Charles, like, Jamie Foxx, he made that, made that blind shit seem kind of like a mood, kind of like a vibe. Grabbing people by the wrist, knowing yeah, they look like. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah. I would still go, uh. I would still go deaf though. Do we want to do another one? Do we want another I mean, one? No, that's fine. We just we leave yeah. it out there. That's you know that's one. Yeah, that's we asked the question asked of the people. week. I think we can. There's there's some upside, I guess, with both. <laughs> See everything or hear everything. <laughs> these are tough. These are tough to come up with. So if you guys if you guys have twisted questions, drop them in the comments because your boy's struggling. Well, that's where you can use the internet to your advantage. Monday mornings, you can go on the busting account, pop that thing out there, and see what people bring up. You know, Fair. then it's no longer on Mitch Carsley. It's now on the people. Help me out. <laughs> Should we jump into, uh, you want to, we want to talk college ball. Your boys, your boys, Michigan had a big win, big win at Penn state. Big win at Penn state did not do a forward pass in all of the second half. I, I, I guess one that registered cause there was a PI that now, moved, the ball, moved the ball down the field. Are you concerned about not throwing the ball in the second half or are you more lean to the side of we didn't have to throw it like we just ran the ball the entire time and I, beat you guys without I loved the way from a uh, blind fan standpoint that the way that Dave phrased it he's like we are so dominant that we decided <laughs> yeah. we're just going to run the ball the whole time me you saw me at Baton Rouge I had a lot of questions like what's going on with JJ is he alright like, did he get hurt because I know he took a couple of hits in the beginning of the game or maybe something happened the week before that um I'll feel a whole lot better after this week. We're playing Maryland this week. I think the line has already started at like minus 20 and a half, which is kind of small. But I, I almost think Michigan's not going to cover that. Why? Because the game is the next week. And I've, I said in the beginning of the year, Maryland's the scariest game on our schedule. 
because it's between okay. Penn State, big win, and obviously all the heightened emotions with the allegations. Sharon Moore, you saw it in his face after the game, and then you go into Maryland, and it's kind of like, okay, let's play this team, even though it's a good ball club, especially in September, they're a great ball club. And then, but you got Ohio State to look forward to after that and just continuing the FU button that Michigan's can just press since, yeah. you know, middle of October when all these allegations came out. So I don't know. I, it does make me, it makes me worried. I just think what if I'm looking at a critical longs, eye? Uh, it was, I'm like, why aren't they throwing the ball? Right. Cause again, JJ's like a uh, Heisman contender. Heisman whether or not he yeah. wins it, whether or not he's in the top three. Yeah, it's up for everybody's debate. But I think after that game, you can't like, you're not going to look back and go, okay, this guy's going to win the Heisman. No, like, yeah, let, yeah. Let's say, let's say he was a front runner, which he had one. I think he betting odds after Michigan State, he was. Does he have a, a best odds still? Which is wild because you have, you know, I think Bo Nix is balling in Oregon right now. That well, Penix kid I think from Michael Penix should be. Good and he's, uh, a he's a stud. And um, is it Jaden Daniels? Uh, the guy from LSU. Yeah, Jaden Daniels. Yeah. Yeah, but he his he team's, is his team's not doing not as well. very good. right 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 if we're talking best player heisman like outside of how well the team does because they are seven and three and one of the best offenses i mean insane possibly the best offense in the country right but they just have zero defense but that dude that cat Jaden daniel like he is a monster bro but, yeah and so if you're given an argument for why jj should not win because there's a lot of good ball players this year a lot of good quarterbacks especially it's Game, top 10 game, the first real game, according to everybody else, you've played this whole entire year. Why aren't you put it, basically putting on JJ's shoulders the entire time? I, yeah, right. I think this Penn State game kind of tossed him out of the conversation. Like, he, he maybe he'll be there at the awards ceremony, but it's, again, you're playing a team like Penn State, like everybody, we, we all watched that game. Like, that was a massive game. Mm -hmm. And a Heisman winner, you're, you're leaning on that guy. Yeah. You're leaning on that guy to now, win the game. But it's, it's more like Blake Corum to me is, you know, somebody who's more of a, a Heisman candidate coming out of Michigan than anybody else. What if J.J. has a good game in the game? I, I Again, I don't it's think. It's hard because it's like you're looking at these guys. like You're looking at Penix. You're looking at uh, Jaden, you said, from LSU. Yeah, Jaden Daniels. And you're looking at Bo Nix. Bo Nix. And it's like those games, those big games are like, we have to have this guy like be dishing out the ball. You have to make sure that this guy... We had to put it on his shoulders because he's going to win it. And that game... Eyes will be on him. Eyes will be on him. And you're like, how do we defeat this man? And now Michigan, you know, we have a, we had a good run game that came out against a team that was, I think, statistically top five. Both teams. Like, that yeah. was a straight running game and defense. Straight running game. It was, it was an awesome... line of scrimmage. It was an awesome game. I just hope JJ is not hurt or something happened where it's like, you don't want to put the ball in his hands to throw it a whole bunch because he had three picks against Bowling Green, but since then he's had zero picks. He's been dishing it. You watch the way he was playing against Michigan State. Like that game specifically stands out in my mind. The way where he, the placement of the football was going, and then the week before that against Purdue, he had a couple of that you know catching guys while they're running, and they're kind of catching it behind them, and a, and a couple of things. So you, and that stands out to you after the Michigan State game, and then this game, no throws. Yeah, eight throws, and he still goes seven for eight with sixty yards. So it's not like, what do you mean still goes? Seven if you're eight? seven for eight. After, I think it was like maybe the first quarter or a couple minutes in the second quarter, he was already like seven for eight. And that's, those are good numbers. I that's mean, a good completion sure, percentage. Yeah, as a quarterback facilitating an offense, those aren't Heisman numbers. Uh, yeah, exactly. But if you're in the first quarter of a game, that's solid. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the only time okay. you threw it. That's what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm wondering what happened that they had to make the adjustment to go and just run it. And I'm looking at it from a critical eye of like, being more nervous than I am optimistic. Like yeah. Dave is taking the optimistic approach where it's like, we don't have to throw the ball with our, with our Heisman quarterback to win the game. We can <laughs> yeah, beat you yeah, any way yeah. you want. Personally, I walked away from that game being like good win boys covered. I thought they played well. I thought the defense was in a bend. Don't break situation against a better offense than they've played. I thought the quarterback for Penn state played really, really, really bad. Yeah, that was brutal. I thought he was terrible because he did throw the ball a lot and he had 50 yards of offense. He, yeah, he was, that was tough to so, watch, man. So that's <laughs> so that now I sit there and just unbiasedly looking at the game, you makes me personally a little more nervous. Yeah, because you yeah I can see that. Yeah. But the, but the the positive is that defense played really well, and yeah, yeah. the quarterback they didn't have a quarterback. It would have been, you know, it would have been interesting had they had an accurate quarterback playing decent, um, which they have at Ohio State, right? Which they have at Ohio brilliance. State. But another positive is like you know you're really leaning on Blake Corum and he, mm -hmm. he was delivering. Yeah, and then obviously the game's coming up. And speaking about the game, dude, uh, bragging rights. Not quite a trophy game, but if Ohio State wins, they get themselves them cute little gold pants. 
Let's talk about Duke Cannon, dude. The new Scent Trophy game was created to support from Bustin' with the Boys team, and it's available in thick body wash and big-ass brick of soap. The idea was hatched for the Bustin' Bowl, which is played between Nebraska and Michigan. We want to bring the scent to life that celebrates college football and its greatest rivalries. College game has... College... Yeah, no, sorry. Trophy game has notes of smoked leather and amber and smells like college bragging rights. Not your randomly assigned freshman roommate. roommate. Thick, high-viscosity body wash. Thick is formulated to, with a noticeably higher viscosity and built to work effectively on your body and not spew down the drain. I need to know what viscosity means. Big-ass brick of soap is three times bigger than the common, uh, the common bar soaps. Triple milled for superior quality, and it's made with natural oils. Find the new Duke Cannon set at dukecannon.com slash trophy game, and now available in your closest Walmart. But yeah, go back to the Heisman talk real quick. If JJ, let's say, balls against Maryland, has crazy numbers, and then he does the same thing against Ohio State, and then he does the same thing in the Big Ten Championship game, do you think he's still out of that Heisman talk? I think he's in like a top five, but I don't think he ever, I don't think he sniffs the top three. I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to argue after seven and eight and 60 yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, if he was balling, it's, I'm trying to be, like, objective about it. To me, it's like if you're looking at who to vote for for the Heisman winner in a game like Penn State, when you're in some third, medium, third, longer, and you're still just running the football, like, you're going to lean on your Heisman player who is the award is for the best player in college football. Right. And to me, it's like Blake Corm is the best player on the team, and Michigan, that's what they're who they were leaning on throughout the entire game. Yeah. If you look at Blake's numbers, though, I mean, he's, his average is like 5.9 yards per carry, but he hadn't had, like, crazy numbers this year aside from the amount of touchdowns he scored. Again, he's not playing a whole lot in the second, in second halves. Yeah, fair. Um, you had an interesting conversation on Thursday at HQ with Casey about how this college football playoff he yeah, can get muddy between five and seven. Do you want to break that down for a little bit? Because I was kind of, I was away from that conversation, getting ready for the pro football football show. Yeah. So, what you ultimately like, what we're going to see is teams being left out of the college football playoff. You're going to have an undefeated Big Ten champion, assuming the trap game, like uh, assuming teams take take care of business. Right. You're only going to look at the game. Whoever wins Ohio State, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, is going to come out of an undefeated Big Ten champion. An undefeated Florida State, as we as we sit here and look at it, a one loss Pac-12 champion from Oregon or Washington, one loss Texas, a one loss SEC champ Alabama if they beat Georgia in the SEC championship, a one loss Georgia, and a one loss Big Ten, one loss Big Ten team. Yeah, if that's how it plays out, I think the way it is trending right now, Georgia has looked more like a Georgia. Georgia looks scary this week. They yeah for sure, but also Bama looks real. I, in my opinion, Bama's going to win the SEC championship. Like, who yeah. do you think? Who do you think comes out? Who do you think comes out of these conferences? Who you're obviously Michigan. Yeah, I don't know who's. Uh, I think the I think the question should be who do we think is left out? Because I think we might live in a world where an undefeated Florida State team could be left out of the college football playoffs. I don't think so. It, I think it, they'll it be undefeated happen. ACC champion. I, and I get it, but like, go to Florida or Florida. Texas, yeah, Florida, Florida, Florida State. Texas is hurt by. Oklahoma, because they lost to Oklahoma, and Oklahoma has just been not great frauds in the college football landscape. Georgia, if they lose to Alabama, Alabama has come on in a big way where it's like, do you leave? Can you can you leave them out? What happens if Ohio State loses to Michigan? Do they go from one to five? Like if Michigan loses all of it, they will they will absolutely be out. People are looking for a reason, and they're three. They would be out no matter what, even without the allegations. You're gonna have Florida State. When you're looking at their schedule, they beat LSU, they beat uh, Clemson, mm -hmm. they beat Duke, they beat, uh, I don't know if Wake Forest has ever been ranked this year, they beat, uh, what's Who? up? Clemson, Clemson's like 500 this year, or yeah, just like, above, they're dead. But, they have but the they're name. starting, but they have the they're, like, they're like starting to play better right now in this back half of the year. They really, I mean, they are. I, yeah, I, I'm I, with, I you. with you. But I, again, I think a win over an LSU, like if- A win Florida over State, LSU is like their only- yeah, because they because they win. they played Duke when Duke was no longer ranked. Duke was Duke was hot September and like early October, and they kind of fell off a little bit, right? They're no longer they're no longer ranked. But if you go off them being undefeated, right, beating right. two SEC teams, because you know people talk about Florida, people talk about LSU, uh, you win the ACC championship, or whoever comes out of that's going to be probably North Carolina, right? Yeah, but North Carolina wouldn't. There's two lost team. 
it'll play into the data of like strength of schedule being good enough to be in the top four. Right. I personally don't think that they're that they're a top four football team coming out of it to the college football playoff. I just think if they do go undefeated, they will get in. So who do you think gets left out? Let's tear them. It'll bring be, bring up the top not bring up the top ten. Let's tear who we think these teams are in the college football playoff talk. Because I'll tell you what, the scariest thing to happen this weekend was Georgia. The way they came out and they're just how is Brock Bowers back? I think if I was if you tier these schools, you, the, the top tier kind of plays itself out. Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State. Mm -hmm. One of those teams will get left out between Michigan and Ohio State. I think tier two right now, yeah. is You know who I... Literally the rest of them to Alabama. So four to eight. Florida State, Washington, Oregon. And then you got Texas, Alabama, who I would jump over Oregon State and LSU right... Or Louisiana right now is Missouri. I put Missouri in my Louisiana, tier. Louisiana, Louisville? I put oh, Missouri you put, over. You put Missouri over Louisville and Oregon State. Yeah, for to round out my tier three. How I think it will end up, my prediction. I think uh, Alabama beats Georgia. I think Georgia is left out of the college football playoff. And I think it is uh, the Big Ten champ, whoever that is. Um, I think Florida State wins out. And then I also think Oregon gets in as a one-loss Pac-12 team. So who'd you pick, Alabama? I think Oregon beats Washington in the Pac-12. Yeah, 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 yeah. My uh, great, great move. I even wrote that for my my uh, direct take too. Uh, our overly direct take presented by Direct TV. Direct TV is the ultimate destination for pro football, where fans can get their football fix in. Whether you're watching games live or on TV, streaming an app, Direct TV has you covered, and you can get Direct TV without satellite. Stop compromising. Start watching football. One eight hundred Direct TV. My overly direct take is Georgia gets left out of the college football playoff. I think Alabama beats them in the SEC championship. I think people will yell from the mountaintop whether Alabama wins by three, seven, whatever. All Georgia should get in. I think Georgia gets left off because, in my opinion, the SEC championship, if it is Georgia and Alabama, should be that extension of the college football playoff getting in. I think the same thing with the Big Ten. That should be an extension of getting in. I think when you look at a one-loss Texas, it becomes down to, okay, you're going to have one-loss teams between, you say Texas wins out, avenges their loss against Oklahoma, and then you have, so I'm thinking Oregon will come out of the Pac-12. Then you got a one-loss Oregon team avenging their loss against Washington. I think Oregon has a better, has had a better schedule, a better run than a one-loss Texas team because Texas almost lost to Kansas State. Uh, they didn't look, who did they just play over the weekend? They didn't look very good over the weekend with Quinn Ewers back. TCU. TCU. They they were in a close one with TCU. Yes, they beat Alabama, but they beat Alabama in September. They're not, they didn't beat this Alabama team that's playing right now where Milrow is not a question mark. So to me, um, that is my college football playoff. Oregon, uh, Oregon, who would I say? Oregon, Alabama, Florida State, and then the Big Ten champion. Well, you need to say who the Big Ten champion is if you're making a prediction. Hmm. I don't know, man. It ain't Iowa. I think it's tough. What's up? That it's definitely not oh, Iowa. Oh yeah, yeah, not the. Oh yeah, yeah, because it's going to come from the game. Yeah, Big Ten champion would be Michigan. You, if if Michigan loses to Ohio State, does Ohio State now go in the Big Ten championship? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be Michigan or Ohio State. It's going to be one of you guys. Yeah. I think it is tough. I think it's tough to determine. If I had to guess, I think Ohio State sneaks you guys. All right. Uh, I, I want you guys to win. I will be clear. I want Michigan to win. Yeah, that's okay. That's how you want to play it. <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm, 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 think, I'm trying to be objective think, on I this. I think Georgia is going to be in. I think Michigan will be in. Ohio State will be out, obviously. Florida State will be in. And then I like the Oregon take because that's going to go down to Washington, Oregon, and the Pac. They'll play each other in the Pac 12 championship. championship yeah. yeah. So Washington the winners. Scary. 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 But Oregon's tough, man. Oregon, Oregon's been on a. Who did they play this weekend? Um, USC. Yeah, Washington played Utah. I mean, Utah has has been has played all these teams super super tough. But like, just Washington seems like they can score at will whenever they want. Yeah, Penix just throws it up to their receivers, and they're like, all right, screw it. Yeah, we're gonna be motivated though. I like they have a they have an older defense, and we talked about on bet the bus them in the trenches. I like the way. 
Oregon plays. Then you get a nice little uh, day and landing speech pregame. I like Oregon. I like Oregon fired up. So that's what I top for. I'll take I'll take Oregon in there. I hope Georgia, Florida Michigan, loses. Florida State, Oregon. I hope they do too. I don't think they're that good. And it's the ACC. I tell you what, if it's Florida- wild because like Clemson won it like two or three years something like that. Just Let's say ago. Florida State loses. Who do we feel like gets in? And and Georgia loses. Uh, one loss, Michigan or Ohio State, and then a one loss, Washington. Because you do, you have a one loss, yeah. Washington, one loss. I mean, one loss, base, one loss, all of them up there. I think the only way you have two Big Ten teams in there is if Michigan beats Ohio State, because Ohio State in the college football playoff is ranked one, and Michigan's mm-hmm. ranked three. So if Michigan loses to Ohio State, they will drop to five. Yeah, if it's a close game, like yeah. last year, last year was a close one, right? Or no. no? Okay. No. If it was like a close game, because Ohio State did still get in. But I think if two teams got in from a conference, I think it would be Ohio State and Michigan because they don't play in the Big Ten Championship. I'm not saying that them over Alabama and Georgia. I'm saying that if Alabama beats Georgia in the SEC Championship, like to me, that should be the play-in to get into the playoff. I think Georgia gets in no matter what. I don't know. And like... In previous years, when two SEC teams make it into the championship, I would agree with you. But because it's so tight between five and eight, it's hard to somebody to lose and then keep them in. Mm-hmm. It's, but like Georgia being two, they can easily drop three spots. Being like, sorry, boys. But they also have back to back natty. So like, yeah. do you keep them in it? Yeah, it's a good, it's, it'll be interesting the, the way these next three weeks kind of navigate everything. I know, it's it's fun time of the year. It'll be fun. Should we talk NFL? Yeah, don't let the Raiders get hot. <laughs> yeah. No. Two in a row. They are Josh Jacobs. Playing better. Yes. All of them are playing better, man. Against, I mean, they didn't score a whole lot of points. That uh, that over that Delaney took did not hit even close, but... Because uh, that Jets defense is crazy. Is that crazy? Will, yeah, yeah, Zach Wilson just hurts them. Yeah. And there's reports coming out now that Aaron Rodgers said he's looking for a December comeback. So, I think the Jets... Hey, that would be so The nuts, Jets are man. playing the Bills and the Dolphins next. They've got to win one of those to keep it for Aaron Rodgers to yeah. even try to come back. Yeah. Because if That's they lose hard, both of those, I think you're, out of, you're not out of the playoffs, but it's not looking great. Yeah. You've got to beat... You've got to beat the Bills. Yeah, it's not looking good. But the Raiders' schedule in the back half is really tough, so. Yeah, I mean, they're in a tough division as well that's kind of overlooked because the Chargers have underperformed this year and the Broncos. The Broncos are actually getting a whole lot better. Yeah. And the Chiefs haven't been putting a whole lot of points on the board either, so it's like, kind of people are like looking past the AFC West. Right, because the AFC North is filled with absolute juggernauts yeah. right now. And the only fraud the only fraud in there is the Steelers. Team. Yeah. Like, they've, I don't know how they're six and three. Uh, but they, hey, they figured it out. The Bengals also had the same record this time last year. Bengals, I mean, Bengals are five and four. Bengals are tough, tough. I can't believe they lost. I mean, CJ Stroud is incredible, bro. He, he's different. The kid is different. Uh, you hate putting it on a play, play or anything like that, but man, Boyd, Boyd catches that ball in the end zone, bro. Sure did. They still might go down and score though. Yeah, but they have to they have to score versus kick a uh, field goal. Yeah, I was. Uh, I think the Texans are going to win the South. They're just getting hot at the right time right now. Texans look good. Yeah, I think the Jaguars are still. This is my third change in the AFC South. By the way, I went. No, I went t- Titans twice, <laughs> but I'm finally like, all right. Yeah, and well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Colts like they got a win, but again, they they lost Richardson. Like they're you know they're still. Three and one at home, zero and five on the road. Zero and five since like November seventeenth of last year. I think the last game they won was that Thursday night game against the Packers away. Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, it is tough. It's like you had that little bit of hope with Will Levis a couple weeks ago, and Will's a stud. Stud. But I just think, yeah, the old line, it's it's kind of back to oh shit. I know, it's tough because you can't easily go overreact at the box score and be like. Is Will not the guy? Which I like, literally came in and said this morning. I was like, hey, is Will is Will the guy or what? Yeah, I think Will. I didn't get to watch a whole lot of ball yesterday, but, but it the, was. But to your point, the Texans are playing good. But I do. I think the Jaguars still get it. Like I still like I. They just lost to a very tough, very pissed off Niners yes. team. 
Um, they were on a five game winning streak. Yeah, I like. Uh, I still we... like the Jags. I like Houston to get in though. I like Houston to get in the playoffs, which is nuts to say after the way that they've been as a team the last couple of years and the, organization. So who's out in the AFC North then? Because we're looking at three teams possibly in the playoffs there. Uh, that, was, that was your fun take a couple weeks ago. I think the Steelers end up still not making it. I think you got the Ravens, uh, the Bengals, and the Browns is how it ended up. I think the Browns will scrap to try to make that seventh spot. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the AFC, the AFC is loaded. When you compare the AFC and NFC, it's all kind of playing itself out now because the NFC is not near as tough as they seem to be in like those first five, six weeks. Uh, go, uh, you got the Chiefs. You got the Ravens, uh, Bengals, Browns. That's four. If you go Jaguars, Texans, five, six, and then there's one more who uh, from the, uh, you would have one coming out of the East, and I think it'll be Miami. You think so? Look yeah. at the Steelers' point, points for and points against differential. Yeah, 156 to 182. That is nuts, man. Just crazy. Because if Just you look at, if you look at the East, then that would means that would mean that the Bills slip and don't get in, which could happen. Like to me, they're not a team that's playing like a a team that knows who they are right now. They all they do is they lean on Josh Allen. Obviously, we're recording this right now on Monday morning, so we haven't watched the game Bills versus Broncos tonight. Um, but as of right now, where my opinion is, is that yeah, it seems like the Bills, the Bills would miss it. I would love to see the Jets come around, right? You would love to see this Aaron Rodgers story kind of play out, him come back in December, he gets into the playoffs. That would be insane because if the Jets have Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback, like they are a so good of a football team because they have weapons, man. Garrett Wilson, he is an absolute stud. Uh, Brees Hall, he just needs the, he needs the offense. To, he needs the offense and operation and stuff to get him going because he's a great player. Um, but they just don't have a whole lot of offense and it starts with that quarterback position because their defense is a championship defense. Yeah. But if Aaron comes back in December, is he really going to be good enough to win? I mean, it's Aaron Rodgers, but I think we're talking so. an Achilles three months. If I'm saying if he comes back in December, I think so. I love that. I, would I love rooting so. for that part of it. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's do good, bad, the ugly. Yeah, a lot of upside. A lot of upside with the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, Busting with the boys listeners. We got an incredible app for everyone uh, who buys gas and who needs to know about upside. We are getting, we are earning cash back for every gallon of gas that you buy. Uh, are you looking for extra cash or money you could use toward paying uh, towards paying bills? Upside is the perfect app for you, and it's not just for gas. You can earn up to 30% cash back at grocery stores, restaurants, and with takeout as well, just use the promo code BUSSIN. That's B-U-S-S-I-N. You get uh, three times more cash back with Upside than any other product out there. This includes loyalty programs and credit card rewards. Just use the promo code BUSSIN. No points or loyalty rewards. Use code BUSSIN. You get three times more cash back. Real cash can cash out at any time. It also works with other loyalty, cash back, and credit or debit card rewards programs that are out there. So that means double the points. Just download the app for free, the Upside app. Use promo code BUSSIN to get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back that you want in your first tank. Again, promo code BUSSIN, B-U-S-S-I-N. Rattle off the good, brother. Rattle off the right, good. All right, all Rattle right. off the upside. Let's talk about the upside for a second. Let's see. All right. I got Fred's. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the hospitality of that place is incredible. Mm. Um, what, Jack, what was the guy's name? I can't believe I keep Darren. forgetting his name. Huh? Darren. Darren. Literally 1 a.m. after Shaq goes on, we're hanging out. We need to get an Uber back to the hotel. He's like, hey, don't get an Uber. Can you guys all fit in my Tahoe? And we're like, yeah. We would. We absolutely can't. Drives us. Drives us to our meet and greet at walk-ons. Like, the dude is just an absolute homie. They had steaks for us on Saturday. He, guys all the time. Uh, good. Michigan football, obviously. That was a big game. That was the most stress I've ever felt as a fan watching the game. I felt alive. I felt scared. I felt everything in between. It was awesome. CJ Stroud, we've talked about him. Guy's an absolute stud. LSU's game day experience. Calling on Baton Rouge. Suck that tiger dick, bitch. Like, all that stuff I thought was... It's the truest form of football first mentality at a university. The truest form I've ever seen. Lions, Deshaun Watson... And uh, obviously, the last good is Shaq and his family. Not just Shaq. 
but his son as well, the group he was with, everybody was super cool. Uh, I was already a massive fan of Shaq, but even more now. Yeah, I mean, Shaq was, that was crazy. That he was awesome. a monster. Dude's a monster. Came up, gave me a big bear hug. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, you're uh, always uh, the biggest cat in the room, dude. And seeing you next to Shaq, it's just like, it is incredible. Like how big this man is. Even his son, his son's seven feet tall, right? Sharif. Yeah. And uh, when he's standing next to him, he's making him just look like a twig because Shaq is so wide, bro. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a grown, that's a grown man. Grown ass man. And dude, <laughs> I've said this before. I said this at uh, Fred's, but when I meet other tall guys, their go-to phrase is like, man, I'm used to being the biggest guy in the room. I always think, what a weird thing to say. But when I met him, I was like, should I say that for just some like filler here or what's the deal? <laughs> you understand it now. Yeah, you understand it a little bit more. This dude came in and, and bear hugged Taylor and put like his chin on the top of your head. Yeah. I said, no, no, no. He goes, yeah, I went to like, I went to like get out of it. I thought someone was messing with me. He said, no, 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 big guy. No, no. I'm like, yo, is this who I think it is? This is after we obviously met him the night before and Shaq, you know, I'm not a big EDM guy. That went hard. That was awesome. But that's my good. That's my good. Um, let me look here. Okay. My good Josh Dobbs. Shout out the boy. I mean, he's just playing well. I, and we didn't talk at all about, uh, we didn't talk about the NFC, but the, to me, the Vikings are a playoff team. And, and that conference isn't a conference like the AFC. Like a lot of teams are going to be battling there to the end, but the AFC, like it can play out so many different ways. I feel like the NFC, you can kind of tell who's going to be in the playoffs. You got the Lions. In my opinion, the Lions, the Vikings are a playoff team. Uh, somebody's got to come out of the South. I'm rooting for uh, Coach Arthur Smith because I don't think the Saints. That to me, that's the weakest. Uh, that's the weakest division in football. Uh, the West, the Niners are going to come out of it. Probably the Seahawks. So you got two from the North, two from the West. That's four. Then you got somebody out of the South. That's five. Two's got to come out of the East. I think it's going to be the Eagles and Cowboys. Like to me, that is just, that's more of a, a cookie cutter something kind of easy to predict yeah but yeah man josh dobbs the way he's able to operate uh kevin o'connell i think it speaks a lot to his leadership and how they're kind of running things over there it's the next man up mentality they're embracing it they're playing really good football uh cj stroud i mean you go in i was standing on the pro football football show to be the man you got to beat the man and he i mean two weeks in a row now game winning drives like they are riding high coach ryan's he's got those boys lit up after the games and in the locker room uh, you can tell that they're building something special there. The Raiders got it. Shout out the boys, the silver and black. The Raiders now two games in a row with AP uh, at the helm. Victory cigars in the locker room. They've done well. They've played some good football. Um, I also had the chaos over the college football playoff. We talked about that. And then I've absolutely nutted all over the board over the weekend. Nine, three, and one in the pro football football show. Ten and three in slips and picks. If you're not going to hype yourself up, who will? Um, but yeah, that's my that's my good. That's my shouts to the good. That's awesome. That is, that is a good move. What I need to see the records for pro football football show because I think we we're a lot similar in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I have to go, sure. I'll have to go double check. But I'm not mind me by myself. Great job. Yeah. How did we do in bet the bus? Bet the bus. I believe two and four. It wasn't good. Oh, it was bad. I think I think two and four, maybe three and three. But I don't. I, don't, I feel pretty strongly that we went two and four. A humbling weekend. Yeah. Tennessee really let us down. I mean, not to, I'm not trying to throw salt on the wound. No, you know, no, I, no, you know, no, I like no. root for Tennessee. I, I remember we talked about this growth. In LSU, growth. I'm yeah. Not letting my yeah that's right. That's right. That's right. My life anymore. Yeah. That was, uh, that was so, massive. Well, yeah. And I guess seeing any kind of, is seeing that comment, old Jack saw that comment. It's like, okay, he's trying to shit on Tennessee. I'm really not. No. To me, they let us down. Like, oh, it, that was a team that should have played way better at Mizzou. I mean, they scored six points. That's the lowest. Is that the lowest in the hype, in the hype era? Maybe, maybe. I mean, definitely is the lowest we scored all season. Man, um, that was just, that was a bummer. Yeah. That was a bummer. All Tennessee teams are bummers right now, but, you know. I don't think Oregon. Keep it moving. Keep I don't it think moving. Oregon fully covered against USC. I think they won by 14, not. It was, it was part of the worst bet the bus uh, showing this year. Yeah, because I don't, th have we went two and four at all? I don't know. I know we've been 500 See, a few times. Yeah. Yeah, so 500 is. Worst showing. Yeah. I'll take tough. that. I'll take that one. For the team, put it on my back. That's big of you, Jack. Yeah. So big bad, yeah. Kicked off the bad. Two and four, bet the bus. Uh, I hate that we let you guys down. I think we'll we'll come back firing. You know, every setup or every uh, setback is just, you know, set up for a comeback, whatever that quote is. Bad. Um, SEC just firing head coaches left and right. But the good, the upside, 
You should aspire to be a, a fired uh, football coach. I mean, yeah. who can negotiate? With a renegotiated deal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A $76 million buyout. That is absurd. absurd to not coach ball over the next six years. It was the six years, eight years. He's chilling. He's chilling. I mean, these, these ball coaches who get fired. McDaniels was another one. I think it was 40 something million was his buyout. Aspire to be a, a, a fired pro ball coach a or fired college tenured coach. coach. Yeah, fired tenured coach. Yes. There you go. Uh, the Big Ten. I got the Big Ten. I think the decision that they had for the suspension was Harbaugh was a bad suspension. Either go all in or wait for everything else to play out. Um, and again, the bad. I'm going to go back. Like, I know I'm going back to old wounds here, but the referees against Michigan State, <laughs> against Nebraska, if they don't see this domino effect that they've now created, Nebraska's dropped two in a row, and I did think it started with the with the zebras at Michigan State. So that's my bad. I do have Nebraska in the bad. Um because dro dropping two in a row, and I feel I didn't put them in the ugly for, for because they're not out of bowl season yet. But they got three tough games coming up. Two, from, they have two, le two oh, left. Right, two it's left. Two left. Yeah, and who is uh, Wisconsin and Iowa? And Wisconsin, I'm, I think lost two to Northwestern over the weekend. Minnesota did they? Sure they did. Don't let Minnesota. If Minnesota lost, then that means we still have everything out in front of us. <laughs> Wait, no, no, no. Iowa, Iowa, had, Iowa, Iowa didn't won. lose. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. Iowa, if they dropped the next two, though, and you guys went out and Minnesota did lose. Yeah, who's Iowa? Iowa is playing Illinois this week, which Illinois has been playing some weirdly tough ball. Yeah, yeah, Illinois beat Minnesota. Holy. You're right. So we need Illinois. We yeah, need Iowa's Illinois. only one, too. But go ahead. Go ahead with the... Uh... I put them in my last one only because, like, I know the expectation you have for your team was set at 9-3. and, three, nine and, and nine floor, A floor of 7-5, and five, but my yeah. uh, prediction was 9-3. and three. And I feel like just the goal of getting out of the, you know, shitty football talk of Nebraska, just get bowl eligible. And then it's like, you've got that monkey off your back. You can keep moving and then look on the high, better things going into the rural area that, so that's why they're in my bad and not, not the ugly yet. Because if they lose next week, it's like, Oh shit, we got to be a rival who you guys beat last year just to make a bowl game. Yeah. Um, the bad lack of sleep this weekend. There was a lot of moving parts from Thursday to get into Sunday. That was just, it was just a lot of no sleep. People who towed trailers 15 miles an hour under the speed limit. I was almost, I was technically late to putting my kids, bringing my kids to school today, but the line was a little long to drop off. So I actually ended up making it. But there was, there's a level as a father when you're driving your kids to school and you take pride. I had, a, I have a great streak going when I drive my kids to school of getting them there on time and dangling, moving around a lot of one lanes also. And that was I, that, that guy that sat in front of me almost ruined my streak. My daughter, she was fighting tooth and nail not to just put some some Ugg, sparkly Ugg boots on this morning. And it's like, dog, just put the shoes on. It's all good. Like, it, no one's going to care. Like, it's. You, I wish you knew how not big of a deal this was. And then my last one was uh, was Nebraska. But a little bit of a fight this morning, a little bit of a, a struggle, a power struggle this morning with my three-year-old daughter. We ended up winning the battle, and I feel real good about it. They were stoked to see Dad, because I know last week I tweeted about how I, they want mommy to put him to sleep. They want mommy to put him to sleep. I get home. I say, hey, who's putting you guys to sleep tonight? They both screamed daddy. So that was, we're looking up in the family category yeah. right now. We are looking up. Yeah. As someone who doesn't have kids, do you want to be the one putting your daughter to sleep? Or is it more just like, it feels good that your daughter wants you to be the last one to see you before? You want them to want you to put them to sleep. Gotcha. Because sometimes it can be, I don't know how it is for Rue, but for my kids, Wins plug and play. We know what our things are. She does her thing. Hey, no fussing tonight. She goes, you got it, daddy. Love you. See you later. Willow, you're kind of in this three-year-old war right now where she's testing boundaries and it takes a solid 45 minutes just to put her to sleep. And it that's with negotiations. That's with mental fortitude. That's her and I going back and forth. What's like, like you her, gonna, what does she negotiate? Like, what does she want? She just, she does everything to play the game longer. And this is a big one she does right now is we go potty before bed. And then I get her dressed. We read the book. We snug. We do like our little thing because you want to keep the routine routine set with them all the time, keeping the same routine so they can feel some sort of stability when you go to bed. Jordan Peterson talks about that. But she's been doing the shit lately where you put the pajamas on her and you get ready for bed and you go to put her in her crib and she goes, Daddy, I have to go poop. And it's so frustrating because now I have to take off the footy pajamas, which is a onesie put her on there, and then she wants to fuck around for 10 minutes. And then finally, she does shit, and you're like, well, at least I, you know, I let her. 
would have felt bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a couple times here and there where she does lying. it. Yeah. She lets out a couple of toots and she's like, I'm good. And I'm just like, all right, let's go to bed. And you kind of pick him up a little more aggressive than you usually do. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> grab him, shake him. All right. Yeah, all right. Daddy Still almost fell. There. Daddy almost yeah, fell. So, daddy tripped. But yeah, you got to know where the cameras are. So that's a bit of, it's a hassle right now. And I think right when they get around two years old is when you, when they finally figure out like, oh, I can, I can fuck around a little bit and make another 20, 30 minutes out of this thing. Hang yeah. out. Yeah, we'll, we'll see with all Rue. Like, Rue is, she's more pro-mom on putting her to bed. Like, we'll set her down once we brush her teeth and do all that stuff and we're going over. Uh, and she sees daddy sitting in the chair. She'll just look at look at me and go, uh, bye-bye, bye-bye. Oh. And I'm like, hey, sweetheart, it's, it's daddy's turn tonight. No, bye-bye. No, mama. And then she kind of does the waddle over to mom. Yeah, but the wind for my for Charles and I is my routine goes faster with Rue. That is Charles big. up there. She's in the room longer because I, I don't know. I don't know how Charles runs the operation. I am familiar with it a little bit, but to me, like Rue doesn't get, she'll be like, book, book. Like, We're not reading tonight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, we don't do that. Once we read and then she points and wants to go to the crib and then she tries to finesse me by being like, hey, you know, you want another hug, sweetheart? And so I'll pick her up and kind of rock her. But then she'll point to the rocking chair again. And then once I go to the rocking chair, once I sit there, then she'll try to be like, book, book. I'm like, no, sweetheart, no more book. It's quiet time now. We got to get ready for bed. And so I'll just hum and kind of do my little songs to her until she's like, all right, time for bed. Then I put her down and we're, we're golden. You dip. Yeah. A good, it, yeah. It's a good, probably 20, 15, 20 minute tops. That's solid. But I am starting to experience the Rue wanting mom over dad. And it's hard because it does, you, it may, like, you can look at it and be like, I get it. But then, and you'll understand it. And then a couple of times later, you'll be like, man, that does, I wish they kind of just mm -hmm. want to hang out with me a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you catch yourself doing a little bit more fun stuff. When discipline happens, it's like, <laughs> hey, honey, why don't you go ahead and handle that? And it works. That actually works, by the way. For dad's way. listening, you want to get an upper hand, make your wife discipline a couple more times and then be the fun, be like, I don't know what she's being all crazy for. Like, you guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come over here. Let them fight it out a little bit. Dance. Yeah, but we're, we were on the ups in the Lawan household as far as dad's concerned. So you want to hit ugly? Uh, the only ugly I had was Texas A&M, which we hit on. Yeah. A&M having to do, hit that buyout. By the way, the guy flexing that dollar amount, 170 something million dollars for that giveaway, that big check on the field. What a way to show your balls of how much money Texas A&M has. Uh, a question I did have, do we think Urban Meyer goes to A&M? That'd be cool. You don't think so? You don't think he gets out of the, you think he's just, you don't think he'll get that itch? Part of me is like, this is, Urban Meyer, he's like one of those obsessed football coaches. He loves to win. He's a competitor. I they just feel like he has that spirit that will eventually bring him back into the game. And money talks. And if you're able to do a $70 million buyout, yeah. they can be, they be like, hey, name your price. We've seen the product literally Florida, championships. Ohio State, championships. Yeah. It's like proof's in the pudding. And you brought up some good points before we came on the show. Comes into a solid roster. Solid foundation, great fan base. NIL money out the ass. At the ass. So you're you gonna can get just, whoever you want. Yeah, you can run that operation. He can be that. He could be that guy. He and really we could. know like all head coaches have egos. All so the majority of people in sports have egos, but we know it being on film and the resume of uh, Urban and all the stories, he's got a huge ego. Right. So I think he'll I think he'll come around once he gets bored with all this, all this uh, mainstream TV stuff that he does. Yeah, and I, and Michigan State's been calling for Urban Meyer forever. They don't have—I don't think they have the funds to get him. No, they don't have the team. Like yeah. they don't. That's not a situation. He's not yeah. trying to rebuild anything. Michigan State's in, in a really bad spot right yeah, now. Yeah, Michigan State's—they're in, they're in a, a very, spot. very, very tough, tough spot. spot. I'll go quick with my ugly uh, Titans. It's just—it's just hard right now. Is it over? Season over? Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's never. I mean, bring up the schedule. Yeah, we can. Let's do the schedule. Every team that's favorited here, we should pick Titans to win. Oh, I think that'll be uh, Jags. I think they beat the Panthers. They could beat the Colts. They could. They could beat the. <laughs> Right, that's, a tough tough. That's, that's, no, a tough, that's a tough That's a tough That's a tough back, back half. half. Yeah, that's a tough back half of the season. There's literally AFC South games. Two teams that are are good. Now, Jack, I will ask you and not put Taylor in this spot. Thank you. Uh, do you hope the Titans lose out so the draft pick is higher? That's like such a tough answer because as a fan, you never want to like prey on a loss. But 
strategically looking forward. I don't think people are going to be upset if we like are losing out, but I would never like if we saw the Titans win out right now, it'd be awesome. I'd be ecstatic. I don't want to see losses, but at, at the end of in two and a half months when the season's over, these losses don't mean as much when you have a much higher draft stock. Based on the product you've seen, it's almost like we just got to get it. We got to get a line. Let's get a great. Let's get a high. Let's get a high draft pick. We got to get some linemen that are gonna go the distance. The protection is so scary right now, and like if we don't get that, you know, put in place, we're just gonna continue to be in this like lull of eight and eight type mentality, and we'd be lucky to be eight and eight this year. I don't even know if it's possible. Five, and so I don't want to tank, but. The next one at Jacksonville is tough. Yeah, at Jacksonville, we in the season in Nashville with Jacksonville Texans almost back to back with Seahawks. Scary, <laughs> scary hours. The witching hour is here for the Titans, <laughs> and I'm gonna have scary. a really good. I'm gonna have a really good December. Doesn't matter what my teams are doing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love life. I'm gonna it's, fucking love life. It's gonna be <laughs> hell yeah. That's just, I love that. Man. It's gonna be a. A good month and a half for you to flex those new tools you've developed. Yes. So I'm happy for you. Are you proud of yourself for leaving the O line in such disarray? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that's crazy. Yeah. That's tough, <laughs> you and Ben, tough. we didn't get Ben Jones on here too. Are you guys proud of the fact that you left this team in such disarray on the offensive line? Man. Hit peace going. It's, yeah. it, it is tough. I saw a couple clips because obviously all the two birthday parties I was at yesterday after that long travel day. The dads are like, hey, man, you suiting back up? <laughs> like, Shut the fuck up. Dads are like, Titans, huh? Oh. I'm like, hey, they'll be all right. That's always my answer. My go-to, hey, they'll be fine. Yeah. Either way, one way or another. But yeah, man, that's uh, it's tough. Should we get into the Steve-O podcast? I have one more question for you. Uh, yeah. Do you like drones? I do like drones. Are you going to Vegas this weekend? I am going to Vegas. The this boys, weekend. the whole squad, we're going to Vegas. The whole racing world is going, and our friends at Duracell, Duracell has invited us to the drone show that is right before the race with over 500 drones illuminating the sky over Las Vegas. It's going to be an epic tribute to the fans of Williams Racing, featuring the partnerships between Williams and Duracell. Come join the boys. Williams Racing and Duracell to illuminate the skies over Vegas with 500 drones in a tribute to Williams Racing Fandom Saturday, November 18th, along Las Vegas Boulevard, right outside the Encore Win and Fashion Show Drive. Also, if you want to win tickets to see Williams Racing in, at next year's Miami race, we're giving away the ultimate experience, race tickets, paddock club passes, meet and greet with one driver, and tons more. Mm. Uh, follow us. Is there anything below that, Jack? Visit, to check out this giveaway, visit DuracellMiamiExperience.com slash Barstool to enter. Again, race tickets, paddock club passes, and meet and greet with one driver and way more. Visit DuracellMiamiExperience.com slash Barstool to enter. All right, Steve-O podcast is coming up next. Uh, it's an hour and a half long, and I think. Hour, 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 hour and 50 more. minutes long. Hour and 10 minute podcast. A th yep. Long episode for the squad episode. today. Drop comments. We love to see it. We're, yes. This is truly, <laughs> this, is this for me was truly like meeting one of your heroes you grew up watching. The guy, the stories he tells, the laughs, the seriousness. We talk a lot about Bam Margera and his situation and what they've gone through, his process of help, trying to help Bam since he's, battled addiction for so long we tour his house and it obviously there's a vlog out on that it's truly it this for me was like a holy shit moment it was so awesome i wish you were there it was i loved it bro it was so awesome so please enjoy this episode and i believe we had all the ads too. this so this is gonna be ad free for you boys ad free correct i believe so we have everything yeah. all right if we're ad free Enjoy this post-show interview, basically free of ads, with Steve-O. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Bustin' with the Boys. I am absolutely privileged to be sitting with you here today. I, I need to tell you a story before we get into it. Our guest is the legendary Steve-O from Jackass, from Wild Boys, from having a rap career, from doing comedy. The man fucking does it all, dude. Does uh, it all. I'm 
you want to be careful about dropping f bombs at the very top of it. That can get that can get your uh your yeah, dude. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Bust with the Boys. <laughs> the we have with guy. us the amazing, the awesome Steve-O, uh, jackass, wild boys rapper, does it all, man. And I, I do have to tell you this real quick before we start. I was in a situation, I was at UFC 290. I grew up a massive fan of jackass. And sitting in front of me was Johnny Knoxville. And I, I dude, I literally sat there and I was like, bro, that's fuck, that's Johnny. Like, I, I got, I... But I have a weird thing about giving people flowers like that in public because then you don't know how he's going to react or all that. He seemed like he was having a nice time with his lady. I missed out on the opportunity. So here I am sitting with you being like, dude, you shaped my childhood. Okay. For the better or for the worse. I don't know. But you did it. Right now, uh, 290, that was um, the BMF one in Salt Lake City. That was Las Vegas. Uh, with uh, 91 was the BMF one in Salt Lake City. Who, who was uh, Valkan... Volkanovsky. It was a uh, right, 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 international right, right. fight week. Yeah, it was, it was awesome, dude. But I, you... forget, I forget where I was, but uh, I, I certainly watched it. And Knoxville's uh, prank panel promo was strong. Strong. You, yeah, it, it was a strong promo. I reached out to congratulate. I, I was in England still. I reached out. I said, "Hey, Knox, uh, congrats on your promo." Um, for uh, the prank panel on the UFC, it looked great. And check out my press. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was forwarding him from my publicist uh, all of the press that I got for jumping off the Tower of London Bridge. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of it. I haven't scored a publicity jackpot like that in, in quite some time. And um, Knoxville wrote back. He said, thanks for the congrats. And thanks especially for sending me, for, for compiling all 49 of these press links. You saved me a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> we have like this running joke that uh, Knoxville would be mortified to ever like share a link to his press with anybody. That's just not in his DNA. And and that's a hundred percent who I am. Yeah. Has have you has that become you over the years? Or no, no, no. I've always, always been. Oh no, yeah, dude. Yeah. There's but, nothing wrong with being an attention whore. Like, You're you know, sitting next to one right now. Yeah. I mean, dude, can we agree that attention is the single most valuable commodity known to man? It's, especially at this day and age, no question about 100%. it. It has been like uh if there was a uh graph to show the value of attention of it it has just done uh with a hockey stick yeah or a ramp like you have in your backyard yeah, right now for sure dude it's uh it's wild seeing like the dynamic between all of you growing up and where you guys are are all at now do you want to keep doing more stuff like how long do you want to keep doing this gnarly shit um i uh I, I certainly have a, a finite time for the really high impact stuff. Um, I, I, I've just taped um, a, a comedy special, which I believe you guys are holding this episode to promote. And mm. by the way, thank you for even considering doing that. Uh, possibly uh, the, the my bucket list special is already available as we're you know in the future when this comes out. Um, but the buggy list, I, I got real high impact. I got real life threatening, like uh, heavy stunts, man, that would never have been allowed on Jackass. I properly raised the bar. Um, five people passed out in the audience at the taping of the. No way. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's not even unusual at all. Like, we always have people pass out in the audience. Like, uh, we average a dude per night for sure. We just happen to have five of them pass out um, at the first show of the taping. Three passed out at the second show of the taping, but yeah, it's it's heavy, intense stuff. And um, now I'm putting together the follow up to the bucket list, and that is even more high impact. Um, and after that, I don't know. I don't know. After might, that, you might, have to gone too far. Tour might be uh, gone too far. It might be the swan song for for really beating myself up. And and if that's the case, that's fine because uh, I've I've really uh, kind of diversified in my different ways of seeking attention, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe a podcast, you know, like maybe podcast because podcasting is going very well for me. Yeah. 
Uh, YouTube is going very well for me. Um, Stand up is going very well for me. And it doesn't always have to be this multimedia affair with me beating myself up. Uh, for now, I love it. But yeah, who knows? But when you do like Wild Ride, looking at something like Wild Ride, your, your podcast, you sitting there, the budget is not near what a multimedia, all the stuff you were doing. Like that's right. low risk and you still get some reward out of that. This, yeah. is, this is that big boom. Like you, yeah. you gave us seven minutes of that and the intro is incredible. I don't want to say too much about it because I want people to go see it. I don't want to like give away anything. Yeah, I mean, the intro is amazing. Mind. I'm not too precious about letting people know what, what my creative is because number one, they're... There's nobody in the world who's going to copy or, or steal my ideas because yeah. there's nobody willing to do them. And um, number two, uh, even if you know what happened, like, um, you know, seeing it is a, a wildly different story. And, and, and I've always made a very big deal out of opening sequences. You know, uh, certainly with Jackass, we've always made a big deal out of it. My last comedy special, which was multimedia, like, the, the features the worst injury, by far the most painful experience I've ever been through. Um, for the opening sequence to that comedy special, I was duct taped to a billboard truck and driven down the highway to Denver. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? no shit. Yeah, From I mean, L.A.? Candidly, we pieced it together. I was genuinely driven duct tape to the side of a billboard truck from LA to Vegas. Once it got dark, we took me down and then uh, we picked up the rest of the Colorado footage, you know, uh, piece by piece. But yeah, I mean, Knox was hitting baseballs at me after duct taping me to the side of a billboard truck. It was rad. So I, I needed to outdo that with the opening sequence to the bucket list special. And I just thought, man, I want to... Uh, I wanted to find me on the roof of a building, you know, a helicopter above me, drop a rope ladder, and I grab the rope ladder and get flown all around, dangling from a rope ladder from a helicopter, get crashed through a bunch of crazy stuff, and end up dropping from the rope ladder onto the roof of my moving tour bus as an exercise in delivering me to the theater. And... uh yeah, and, and it, it, it was ambitious, it was expensive, it was dangerous, particularly the part where I drop from the rope ladder onto the roof of the moving tour bus. Yeah. Like, that's just sketchy, man. There, there's no way around that. And uh, we made it happen, dude. When you do that type of intro, is it one of those things where, like, all right, you get picked up by the individual who's flying the helicopter, which is also a treat? Then you go do this, then you dip in the pond, then you, or you do that all in well, one fail were all, Yeah, it was all like, like, uh, not, not one take. It was, yeah, yeah. We, 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 you know, like, uh, blast me through the lake, and then reset, and mm -hmm. then blast me through the electrical wires, and then reset, and then, yeah. A lot of times people, when they have a thing, like you, you had Jackass before that was Big Brother, and then it evolved into everything that it became. Once it came to an end, and you did obviously Jackass Four just a few years ago, you've done an amazing job of pivoting and rerouting, finding ways to, in our in our words, seek attention and find new ways sure. to, you know, keep building on this brand that you have. What was your, what was your process to find podcasting, to find doing the bucket list and all that stuff? Well, first off, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, and uh, with respect to um, kind of evolving and and uh, it's it's not been something that was that, that was since the last Jackass movie. Um, it uh, and and I was more shocked than anybody that there was a fourth Jackass movie in the cards. I mean, legitimately, like I would I would have bet the farm that the jet that the ship had sailed. Like yeah. for Knoxville to come out of the woodwork. 10 years after the fact and be like, I'm ready to go again. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. But of course I was open to it. Um, particularly because I had stayed so active for those whole 10 years. I was like, I mean, there's like, we don't have to test me. Like I know that I still have this in me because I've kept my doing dumb stuff muscles very strong. Yeah. My dumb stuff muscles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I even said, I was like, well, guys, like, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing this stuff, putting it on YouTube anyway, you know, yeah. I might as well do it for a movie. Uh, it was a no brainer. And, um, you know, here we sit in 2023 
And, uh, you know, like, it's been 10 years. It was 2013 that I uh, went on YouTube. Yeah. You know, so back in 2013, like, uh, multiple people said, man, you really got to get on YouTube. You really got to start a podcast. And um, and when I first heard it, I thought, man, God, I've been uh, in like, a few number one theatrical, you know, box office movies. Like I've had like TV shows with my name in the title. Like I'm a bona fide TV and film star. Like you're talking to me about uploading YouTube videos. Like, man, that's a really uh, depressing. It's an ego shot. Yeah, dude, it was tough for Mm. me to swallow the idea at the time. Like, uh, I, I, I didn't think there was money and I like, you know, when I upload YouTube videos, like, uh, you know, I just, it, it, it felt like something that, you know, my ego told me it was beneath me, but like I did it anyway, you mm-hmm. know, I did it anyway because, um, I had been trying at that point in 2013 to, uh, pitch a new TV show. No, nobody cared about it. At the last TV show that I had, like, I got replaced. Uh, you know, this killer karaoke show. And that same year, 2013, Knoxville was making Bad Grandpa, which was under the Jackass banner. And it was like, we didn't even know what it was particularly. It was, we were just like, wait, hold, hold on a second. Knoxville is making a Jackass movie without any of us? Like, we got straight... Timber Lake over here, <laughs> you know. Now we're the Jackson Four. Like I'm the fucking Tito over here. Like, and uh, it was just a really dark time, and and um, I was super super in a dark place, and I just you know learned how to edit. My buddy Sam Macaroni taught me how to edit. I just made YouTube videos, not because I thought that it was going to be a like a viable like way to make money, but just I did it just to try to keep my sanity. Yeah. You know? And the way that I went about getting on YouTube was um, like pretty highly strategic. There were at the time uh, YouTube pranks were like the biggest phenomenon. You had like these guys Vitali and Roman Atwood like clocking five million views every time you know and uh both vitaly and roman atwood uh you know they they were they were excited to help me because they were fans of jackass but the position that they were in on youtube was way you know like so we were like we were like mutually like super uh excited to work with each other Mm -hmm. and i was starting at zero and 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 uh when i uploaded my first I uploaded two YouTube videos the same time to launch the channel. Each video drove traffic to the other, and I collabed with both Roman Atwood and Vitaly, We're and nuts. both of, both of their channels drove traffic to each of my videos, which drove traffic to each other. So it was highly coordinated, and um, I landed on YouTube like. I think in 24 hours, I had 125,000 subscribers. Oh, like, that uh, is nuts. Yeah, I had, um, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of views, maybe like 200,000 views on each video. And, um, like, I, they were like, USA Today, I think, wrote an article about how I landed on YouTube, like, with such a crazy splash. And um, all of a sudden... <laughs> You know, I, I at the time I was touring comedy clubs, and I was still very green in that department. There was no indication that uh, I would have any staying power on the comedy circuit, um, and and I only had agency representation for comedy club touring. Period. Mm-hmm. But once I landed on YouTube, I got like my lawyers reaching out. Hey, I'm hearing from every like one of the big agencies, they're really dying. They're clamoring to represent you in the digital department, you know? And like, huh? You know? And like, so I'm taking meetings, I'm getting new agents. The the agent I went with was like, hey, I can get you on a plane to Atlanta to be in a movie with Samuel L. Jackson tomorrow. (laughs) You know? And I was like, sure. Sign my ass up. Yeah. 
Uh, as I've come to learn that like every, every time an agent wants to sign with you, they always have a really exciting, compelling reason to sign with them. <laughs> and as soon as you're signed with them, they're done. <laughs> yeah. They will lazily answer the phone if it rings. Yeah. <laughs> they will do nothing. Damn. God, I hate agents. But um Are you so you're agentless. Yeah. Hundred percent agentless. How many agents did it take to get through to this well, point right here? And and, and uh and my, my my touring agent became a manager. Yeah. And uh now he's trying to tell me that I need an agent as well as him, and it's a tough one. It's a real tough one, man. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a real tough one, but that's another story. And what, what I'm just saying is that getting on YouTube brought about a full, like, rebirth, like uh, a renaissance mm -hmm. in, in my career. It, like, it, it, it made me go from, like, being in front of the camera and at mercy of corporate executives to do anything to, like, in control. Of, of every move. And, and that was huge. Also at the time, <laughs> this is the crazy part, <clears throat> on that comedy club tour, at the end of every show, I said, guys, thank you so much for giving me a chance at stand-up comedy. And I want you to know now, I am not going to go anywhere or do anything until I take a photo with every single one of you guys in, in the room. And uh, so I would do a meet and greet with the entire audience uh, after every single show. I did that for 11 years. Um, in the beginning, it was uh, for two reasons. Number one, like um, people were pleasantly surprised. They'd come to see me in a comedy club with just no idea, the lowest expectations you could possibly imagine for a stand-up show. And they would be pleasantly surprised. Wow, Steve was a lot better than I thought. And I wanted every single one of those people to go home with a photo with me so that they could post it on their social media and let their following know, man, Steve-O is a lot better than I thought. You know, like yeah. Steve-O comedy is not a bad gig. And, uh, and, the, and I think that that sort of grassroots approach to getting the word out that, uh, you know, I was doing comedy and I was doing it reasonably well, like helped me keep going around the circuit. And um, the other reason I did those meet and greets was it was a bo uh, uh, like, a glorified audition to find out like who I would act out sexually with that night, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like every night, like it was like, uh, it was really, really in intense how egregious, how, just how uh, out of control, like I was as a sex addict, you know, like I, I had gotten uh, chemical sobriety, like pretty stable. I was clean clean and sober for a number of years and it just all like it was like whack-a-mole i just like with the acting out sexually it was gnarly and um it was 2013 that same dark year you know so i had mm. like i'm in this dark place i'm you know i'm the jackson four i got no like my, i'm over i'm done with ah you know and i'm just like acting out so um i uh you know i i thought you know, I subscribe to the idea that for me to like have a good future, like good back nine, that um, I needed to learn how to be in a healthy relationship and have a life partner who could help me weather the horrible, like scary becoming an aging attention whore, you know, like, <laughs> and, um, and I, I, I said, I'm not gonna act out anymore. I promised myself no more fooling around on the road. And I just couldn't do it, man. I just cracked every time. Started seeing a sex therapist, you know, sex addiction therapist. He, he uh, talked me into going into sex addict rehab. Like I, I did the whole thing, man. And in sex addict rehab, they were like, oh, well, like, um, what would the, the, like what most, like uh, is most recommended is a period of total celibacy. Like you don't like uh, you know, like Elvis does not leave the building. Yeah. You know, not on your own, not not anything. And uh that that's like a way to like kind of rewire your brain kind of. And I'm like such a gnarly dude with everything I do. You know, they recommended like 30 to 90 days of celibacy. 
And I did not blow a load for 431 days. Oh, no shit. Straight up. I, it, I just made it into a stunt. You know, I was like, and then the whole rest of that tour um, became, um, you know, like on every show, I'd be like, I haven't blown a load in this, you know? And, yeah. And uh, God, I was irritable. But like that, that. God, I was irritable. 490 days of just and, angry, horny, dude. Yeah. I did not blow a load for the entire year of 2014. And for not blowing a load that entire year, dude, I was a laser. Like, I was a grumpy laser. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was a grumpy laser, and I just poured. Like, I started the year of 2014, I think, with less than a million Facebook followers. Mm. And I ended the year of 2014 with more than six million Facebook no followers. Shit. Like, I was the most productive animal. And uh, again, I started YouTube in 2013. Mm. So 2014, I was just, that was the year that I went digital, you know? And, and I, and I, and focusing I, that nut, man. That thing yeah, was going nowhere. That All that power went to your brain. All of that power went into work, you yeah. know? And, um, you know, and, and, and I, I heard like a lot of people, you know, talking about finding the right person to settle down with. It's not find the right person, dude, it's become the right person. You know, yeah. you attract people who are uh, as healthy emotionally, mentally as as we are. Mm -hmm. It's like <clears throat> like uh, water meets the same level of water. You know, like we attract the people who are as healthy as we are, and if we become healthy, we attract healthy. And uh, and now I'm engaged to be married, and I put in the work, and and, and I still don't have the distractions of chasing pussy around. Like, I don't have the distractions of being wasted, drinking, and doing drugs. Like, I, I literally don't waste time, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I don't waste time on shit. Like, I'm pretty largely always just laser-focused on what I want to accomplish. And now I've got this great life partner who helps me accomplish things. So, like, it, it's pretty gnarly, you Dude, know? It's so awesome to hear that type of story because you hear so many times people like get into addictive personalities and before they can save themselves, it's too late. And having an addictive personality and being able to channel that and focus on something for the better, like it's almost better to have an addictive personality in a sense. hundred percent. Because it makes you, like 100%. if you take the drugs and the sex and you just focus on what you've become so successful in, like you're literally a story that every drug addict, every sex addict can look at and be like, oh, I could actually do this if I just focus this way. Right. And, and, uh, I, I'm going to push back. It's it's never too late, man. You know? It's, well, it's, I'm it's, talking it's, about too late, like, pass right. away or something like right. that. Right. I yeah. mean, the, the thing, like, um, man, I feel so strongly about this, too. Like, um, the the luckiest, like, I'm the luckiest you can be. And I, I feel so strongly about this that um, with, with addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, like, uh, addiction in general, um, it's the only disease where when you treat it, you become a better version of yourself than you were before you got sick. Yeah. Any other disease, the best you can possibly hope for is to get back to as healthy as you were, but we become improved versions of ourselves, mm -hmm. like the, 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 the sober alcoholics, the addicts. And, um, and I'm just profoundly grateful like me in sobriety like say what you want people would be like oh dude you were funnier on drugs like number one i was not like no like i became fucking pathetic like uh you know oh dude steve was a pussy now yep again not true you know like i'm actually doing earlier things in sobriety than i ever did right. when i was loaded like and uh the, the, the reality is that I, I am running circles around every younger version of myself period from and, a production and it, standpoint, for sure. Yeah, and it's all because of sobriety. Um, totally. In those early days, though, of finding, like, realizing, okay, I have to get sober, I feel like what a lot of people don't realize with coming off something or anything is the level of boredom you first receive those, that first 60 days, 90 days. You're like, shit's just not as fun. Like, how did you counteract that for yourself? <laughs> because, you, you, you know, right. like, we've all, yeah. most of us in here have been high. And we sit sure. there and... And you do things for a couple of weeks and then you stop doing that thing for a couple of weeks and then you sit there and you're like, this would be a lot more fun if I could smoke weed or if I could take this. 
Right. And you kind of like, that's how, that's a game you tell yourself. And then you play it in a mental warfare back and forth. And I feel like a lot of people just can't see the other side of that. Uh, I, absolutely, man. And, uh, that, that, that's a common thing. Like there's, there's the boredom thing. There's like the, the, the creative thing. Oh man, I feel like I can't write great songs if I'm not loaded or yeah. like, you know, dude, I'm going to lose my identity. Like, you know, there's a lot of fear around all that. And I remember, um, I don't even know what year it was or what rehab or what like uh stage and in, in Bam's, you know, in his journey that, uh, that it was, but I remember Bam saying to me that, uh, like, you know, man, I'm just like sobriety. It's going to be boring, man. Like, mm. uh, I don't want to be bored. It was that exact same thing. And, and uh, I remember when I told him, I said, dude, uh, recovery from alcoholism, like, Getting into recovery, it's kind of like getting into a swimming pool. And I said, everybody can relate to, like, thinking about getting in a swimming pool and dipping your toe in the water, and your toe tells you that water's cold and you don't want to get in. Right. And if you think you're going to go around to the shallow end and walk down the stairs, um, <laughs> hold on, dude. <laughs> Randy! Randy, hold the work! We're recording! What? Hold the work! Fucking Randy, man. We're recording! Man. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think I can give you a seamless edit right here to, to, to not have that happen. Um, oh, that's dang it. We have Randy. we have Randy. Randy's got to know what he's done. <laughs> We're going to get right. his home address after this. Randy's going to have to hear about that. Right. Uh, now, if you think... You're going to go walking down the stairs in the shallow end and gradually get into the swimming pool. You're fooling yourself. It's never going to happen. Like, we all know that the way to get in that pool is to jump all the way into the deep end. And there's no way around it. When you land in that water, your first thought is, wow, it's cold. It's going to yeah. shock your system because you can't change your, your uh, environment without shocking the system. But we we can all also relate to having jumped in the pool, feeling it was cold, that it's pretty quick. It's shockingly quick how, how fast you acclimate. Like, everybody can relate to, man, I can't believe it felt so cold, like, a moment ago, and now I'm perfectly comfortable in the pool, mm. you know, in the pool. And, um, you know, it's like that. Like, and, um, you know, with respect to, oh, it's going to be boring, it's pretty easy to jump in a pool when you're on fire, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, yeah. if you're on fire, you're not gonna have any issue jumping in the pool. You're not gonna care if it's cold because you're not on fire anymore. Right. You know, and uh, that's really like how it is, and that's that's why they say that people have to hit a rock bottom because, like, rock bottom, like, your life has to get bad enough that you don't care that the boring sounds great mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to the hell that you're in and that's what you know what it was for me like uh you know like uh, bored sure anything yeah. but but this you right. know when when life gets so bad that you will welcome being bored is anything but as bad as it gets then that 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 is what rock bottom should be now the problem with this analogy particularly as it relates to me telling it to Bam, mm. is that we can all understand that you just cannot go around shoving people into pools and expecting them to thank you for it, let alone stay in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and I tried to shove Bam in the pool, man, so many times. And, and he just doesn't want to be in the pool. You, yeah, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, Bam, obviously, all this stuff going on, I, I heard his rap. <laughs> that, that shit was bad let's be honest that shit was really bad i listened to it last night at like one in the morning and i was like <laughs> the best part was him basically like talking insulting you and we man about your skateboarding abilities yeah. and then loki also stuff. saying Ale, i love steve-o but <laughs> yeah. steve-o and like you see it and like i said growing up as a fan you don't expect when you watch jackass for everybody to for it to work out for everyone to be like, oh, these guys are going to be just fine when it's in. But seeing a guy like you with the story that you have and seeing, hey, it is possible. At what point does Bam reach rock bottom? Because from the outside, yeah, from an outside perspective, looking in, 
it, as just a person watching on the internet, it seems like he's just got too many yes men around him. Where it's like, hey, you're going to be all right. Don't worry about this. Let Bam do what Bam does. And he's got enough people around him that's maybe writing a check it, that doesn't want to lose that free meal. It's so perplexing, man. And, and yes, when you say yes, man, like, you're, like the, by definition, you're talking about enablers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's true that most people in active addiction can only stay in active addiction with enabling. Yeah. You know, and it's such an insidious, like, disease that touches everybody close to the addict that everybody's sick, you know? And um, I, I really believe that that uh, it is enabling at the highest levels that allowed Bam's situation to progress as far as it had. But with that said... Man, I've I've been clean and sober for over fifteen years, and you know, like I I live in the world of recovery, mm -hmm. and I don't think I've ever heard of a tougher case of somebody more belligerently resistant to the concept of recovery. Mm -hmm. Someone who spent he calls it the floor to shuffle, like the floor to shuffle, the floor to shuffle where like uh, people are just. Um, recycling you through rehab centers and putting you back in and putting you back in to basically, I guess, like as some kind of a way to get insurance money to mm -hmm. pay for it. <clears throat> but regardless of the reason, the fact is Bam spent over a year. I mean, he's been in rehabs over and over. Like he's been on a tour of rehabs and psych wards and jails for, for years now. And, and he was, purely in rehab from like more than a year and you know still just doesn't like like uh get it you know yeah. you would think like like you did what do they teach you in there like you don't you know but in any case uh i um i i don't i don't know i don't so know like they need to change the scenery there's been, well there's been so many times where i saw his like the comedy club meltdown, like the Dr. Phil, you know, business, like yeah. the, you know, like the, the, each thing worse than the next. And I think like, okay, this is it. You know, I think, okay, this is it. He's gotten bad enough for like this. And it's not like, it's just, it just keeps getting crazier and crazier. And, um, I don't know what it's going to take, man. Maybe, maybe he's got to go broke. Most addicts have to lose everything. For me, it was, uh, just how like, truly humiliated i i humiliated myself into reasonableness mm. like i was then I mean, i'm a douche no matter what how but, I, but I, how, I, do you, I, how do you recognize being humiliated when you're as loaded as you say you were because i got uh and it's what a great question right there i i got locked up in a psychiatric ward by knoxville right um Shout out johnny yeah it was uh march 9th of 2008 and so my sobriety date is March 10th of 2008. We count our sobriety date as the first day we didn't get loaded. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was locked up in there. Like, when, when, when they got me to the psych ward, like, uh, God, I was an unlovely creature. I remember there was that. Uh, they, they got me in the car. And they cleverly showed up with, like, eight people for my intervention. So if I didn't want to go, like, I was going to go anyway. Like yeah. they, and, and I've never been a fighter. So they got me in the car. They drove me to the Cedar sinai Hospital for the psych ward there. The psych ward was ready to receive me, knowing that they had documented um, my qualification for California's 5150 law, which is uh, you can lock somebody up involuntarily for 72 hours if they have presented um, uh, threats to, to themselves or others. And um, they, they, they get me to the hospital, pull up to the curb, and there's somebody waiting for me, like with a wheelchair, for me to sit in the wheelchair and them to wheel me into the hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't need a wheelchair and I'm spit on the person. <laughs> you know, oh, like, like, like I'm at a point where like spitting on people was not unusual. Yeah. You know, that was like... You know, no problem. No, yeah. I've, I've been in a couple of football games where some guys have <laughs> received some saliva for me. A lot of yeah. backlash, a lot yeah. of backlash. 
<clears throat> I, 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 I was, I was quick to spit on people. And, um, you know, when I, when uh, they were, I had, and I was sure I was going to calm, like calmly talk my way out of this and that they weren't going to lock me up in the psych ward. But like, I was wrong about that. And as they're kind of processing me into the hospital, um, you know, I'm like, oh no, but I know I want to smoke a cigarette. And like, then like, I want to smoke a cigarette now. Yeah. And like, you know, my next move is I'm going to grab a, a chair and throw it in a temper tantrum. And like, I don't even get, I don't even get a piece of furniture like off the ground mm -hmm. before orderlies like just appear out of nowhere and just grab me and like, slam me down on a table and I get a needle in my butt cheek no and next shit. thing you know I'm just waking up from a nap you know oh, oh my god I think they, they caught in the straight jacket they no, still ripping no, no. those I things remember, or no? uh, I remember when they, they slam me on the table they're like mellow out or we're gonna strap you down and I'm like on the claustrophobic side so yeah. I mellowed out but like yeah. but I got the booty draw the line yeah I got the booty juice which is like uh <laughs> They they put the needle in your in your butt cheek and then and it's like a sedative. God, I forget the name of. Uh, it was something that I was looking into um, doing for a, a tranquilizer dart foot race. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Also counterproductive because it is a drug as well, right? Right, right. I mean, I ended up making it a uh, general anesthesia bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, that's in the bucket list special, the right. anesthesia bike ride. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so I wake up from the nap and, um, the 5150 law says you can be held in a psych ward against your will for 72 hours, which is three days. But due to my belligerent behavior, they changed my status to 5250, which is two weeks. And that was the saving grace because if I, if they only had me for three days, I would have been right back to the drug dealer. But, um, you know, a number of different things happened over the course of my first week in the psychiatric ward where, uh, you know, I kind of, the, a week was long enough for me to realize, okay, I got to do, yeah. I got to do this. And then the next week was kind of just, hey, I'm ready to go. And everyone's like, sure. Well, yeah, it was seven. I think I was on the seventh day in the psych ward, and I was like, "All right, I got to do this." But to your point, um, you know, how do you know mm -hmm. that you're humiliated when you're that loaded? I, I didn't. You know, I didn't. I recognized that I had to do this, but my best thinking at that point, what gave me the willingness to go to rehab, was that man. If I get, so I'm thinking. If I get clean and sober, dude, dude, the world is gonna owe me, man. You know, oh, I'm gonna shit. be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna do a lot of good, man. I'm gonna be like, my career's gonna go, you know, I'm gonna, like, I'm just thinking I'm gonna get all this stuff out of it, like, like power and property and prestige, that the mm. world is gonna shower me with cash and prizes if I am noble enough to get sober. Yeah. You know, like, uh, and, um, that thing, whatever it takes to get you in there and become willing. But what it was that, that actually revealed how humiliated I was, was this 12 step stuff, you know, like this 12 step stuff where we do like an inventory about everything that bothers us, resentments, fears, you know, harm done others, guilt. And, um, and, and, and we, like break down each thing in this inventory to identify what our part is mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, how we created the problem, you know, how we're responsible for the mess and you know, where can we take accountability? Where can we? And it was like, once I saw my part and that I was the reason for everything that was messed up in my life, like that's where the humiliation kicked in. And that's where the motivation to be sober went from all the cash and prizes I was going to get to, I just don't want to be that douchebag anymore. Yeah. You know, I don't, just, I do not want to be that guy anymore. And, I, and, uh, and I started doing it for myself for the right reasons. And thank God, because there are no cash and prizes for just getting clean and sober. Right. Like it was years that nobody gave a rat's ass if I got clean. So clean and sober now, like people think it's kind of cool. Like, oh man, the way Steve-O turned his life around. But in the absence of productivity and giving people a reason to even 
contemplate my existence. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares if I'm clean and sober. Because yeah, you could have just really sat around in this nice house yeah. and like, I'll fuck off, get fat and whatever. I'll skateboard on my cool ass ramp downstairs. <laughs> this house didn't come along until uh, 2014. I got sober in 20, or I got sober in 2008. Yeah. I bought this house in 2014. So you did Jackass 3? Comedy paid for this house. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, fuck Com yeah. Comedy clubs paid for this house. <laughs> you did, did you do Jackass 3 and 4 sober or just uh, yeah. 4? Yeah, both 3 and 4. So when you're, first off, there's got, I will just, I'll say one point about that, the last things we just talked about, like having the fear and anxiety of all the things you've done to other, other people must be a horrible feeling. But on the flip side, what an incredible feeling it is to see all the things that have happened to you in your life, realizing it's you and realizing how in control of your life you actually are. That is got to be one of the beautiful, most beautiful yin yangs that you probably experienced throughout that process. It, it really takes a lot of, uh, uh, of, What, what am I trying to say? It, it, it gives you a lot of control. If you just look at your own side of the street, and if you just worry about what you can control, if you acknowledge that you cannot control other people, places, and things, and stop blaming other people, places, and things, and take responsibility for your own situation, that's, I mean, for Bam, that's his number one crux of his whole thing is that is that it's everybody else. It's never his fault. It's every, it's, he's just blaming everything on every, it's Knoxville and Tremaine and the bone spurs and, the, you know, and Nikki and she drives me to drink and it's everybody but Bam. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, I really, really, like I said, it's never too late. It's not too late for Bam. It's never too late. Like, and if, if just like a, it would be like flipping a switch. It would be that simple as flipping a switch if Bam could just, like, take accountability. Mm. You know, just stop blaming everybody else. You know, look at your own side of the street. Do the inventory work. Is the, is the Bam thing as heavy on your heart as it seems sitting here with you for this past 30 it's minutes? It's pretty gnarly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's pretty gnarly, man. I mean, it's... One of your uh, closest friends for so long. <clears throat> I mean, he's, he's family, you know, and, and uh, it's crazy. It, it's, it's just, it's gotten to a really, really serious level. You yeah. Know? Especially when you get into, you're filming Jackass 4 and I don't yeah. know all the details, but him essentially not being able to yeah, be I a mean, part of it. When Jackass 4 came up, I thought, wow, it's crazy Knox wants to do another Jackass movie. But like I had been saying, like, you know, Bam's not in a place where we can really do that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that, you know, and they were like, oh, well, I think they viewed it as, like the, the, as as uh, kind of a last attempt to help Bam, it's like all right, we're gonna we'll make a movie and if if we'll give him the chance, yeah, you know, like, and that's how gnarly the the disease of alcoholism is. It's so gnarly that you can give somebody like a guarantee of millions of dollars, and even that's not enough to get not enough clean and sober to sit and piss in a cup. When you, were, when you were working through your sobriety and you go from Jackass 2, you're loaded. Jackass 3 comes. Were there fears in your head or insecurities? Or like, oh, oh, yeah. am I going to be able to do X, Y, and Z the For way sure. I used to? How'd you, sure. get, how'd you get over that fear? Just diving in? Like it seems like you're doing everything? Or uh, was there a dip in the toe here and there? I, uh, I, I had some doubts about whether... Um, I even had it in me, but like once I was once I was in, like I it, it um it just was so important to me. Like it became like a real thing that I wanted to prove that sobriety didn't turn me into a pussy. Yeah. Even though on some level it did, because uh, at that time I was like new. I was newly vegan. I was like newly like exercising. Like really, really careful about what. I ate and, and like, I, I was just, uh, I wasn't killing myself anymore. It was, 2008 was a gnarly, gnarly time to go from like, sure that I would be dead in short order. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I never expected to live very long in the first place. So like the, the whole first, you know, decade of my career, like if you count, it started as a clown. 
Like I, I never, it never occurred to me once to invest anything, to save anything, to like, because I had nothing to save for because I was so convinced that I was going to die young. Like that was the, almost the whole point of being Steve-O was to die young. <laughs> so then along comes 2008 where in March I have this intervention. Now I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the inventory work. I'm, I'm, I'm taking accountability. I'm seeing my, I'm really on fire for recovery. And now I'm not killing myself anymore. It's important to me to conduct myself in a, in a way that, you know, that, that works for recovery, which means now, like for the first time ever, it's striking me, holy, holy crap, I might actually not die, like, really young. Mm -hmm. Like, I might be staring down the barrel of, like, many more decades of life on this earth. Right. Like, and as I'm realizing that, I don't even know if I can, like, even continue this career in the entertainment industry because everything they're telling me about recovery is that you have to deflate your ego. Mm -hmm. You've got to practice spiritual principles in all of your affairs. Like you got to do the right thing when nobody's watching. You got to like, you know, none of that seemed to like fit with being Steve-O from Jackass. Yeah. So it called into question everything that I had ever done professionally. Like, I didn't know, like, how am I going to deflate the ego and be in, be an entertainer, you know, mm -hmm. like mutually exclusive concepts. So I didn't know. And going back to the point of, oh, maybe life would be boring. Like I wanted so badly to not hate myself and to not be humiliated that like, even if like, that's how it's got to be. Like, recovery is your number one priority. Mm -hmm. So, like, I didn't even know if my earnings potential existed anymore. Yeah. And now I might be alive for many more decades. It's a scary thought. And then comes September 2008, and what savings I did have are decimated. Yeah. Also, good and bad thing, because you weren't saving very much anyway, right? So right. you didn't really I mean, take much of a hit. That's a positive. I paid zero attention. Yeah. Like, uh, I had a business manager. I had my dad. I, like, I wasn't broke, but I just never looked. I never even looked at anything, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I, think, uh, I think that, like, at the time I got sober, I had, like, three million bucks. And after 2008, I was, like, barely a million Mm -hmm. After the financial crisis, yeah. like it was like more than a half of what I had was gone, as well as potentially my earnings potential. As you know, oh, as yeah. like uh, it was, it was a bit, really a crossroads. Pretty creepy time, yeah. And so when when Jackass Three came along, it's not like I was gonna not do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, in, in between getting sober and Jackass Three D, I dipped my toe in the water by doing Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, just to see if like how'd that fare for you? I hated it. Left feet. I hated it, feet? and, and uh, yeah, I hated it. It made me so uncomfortable. It made sense to do it because, like, I didn't have to be crazy. I didn't have to take risks. Like, I could rehearse right down the street, and it would get me in front of the camera so I could just determine if that even made sense in sobriety. Yeah. And um, what I didn't factor into my decision to do Dancing with the Stars was, like, being in front of 20 million viewers. It was at that time... TV was still a thing. Yeah. You know, like at that time, you couldn't watch video on a cell phone, I don't think. You know, like uh, at, at that time, um, 20 million people were watching Dancing with the Stars, and I was palpably uncomfortable. Like, and I remember, like, it, it was like more of a test for my sobriety than it needed to be. Yeah. I reached out to some people in recovery, and I was like, I'm not okay. I'm yeah. not, I'm not okay. And, and, and I was told, all right, sometimes you're not going to be okay. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. But when things are not okay, the one thing that will always help is to conduct yourself as a gentleman, to do the right thing. Because even when, like, uh, 
nothing feels good. At least you'll have that to feel good about. Yeah. <laughs> you know? All little things. Make yeah. your bed. Be a gentleman. Right. You'll be all right. Right. And and uh, then Jackass 3 came along, and it's like, all right, I'm, I'm not going to turn down, like, the only the third good job I've ever been offered. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And uh, and and I went into that like I, I care about my health and my well being and you know so I I, I made a rule like uh, I laid down the rule that like guys I've survived enough at this point that I just don't have a sense of humor for dying or becoming paralyzed over a stupid stunt mm -hmm. but if like evident risk of paralysis or death is not part of the equation i will not back out of anything that's and, that's scary and it's it's pretty remarkable how much that actually takes off the table <laughs> 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 but i got through that whole jackass three without compromising on my uh my rules i didn't make it through a, like a week of Jackass 4 without breaking those rules. Really? Yeah. In Jackass 3, before we get to Jackass 4, what was the scariest thing for you that you had to do? You know, like I, the, the most anxiety I remember having going into a bit was the stupid Electric Avenue with the, the, um, the, yeah, with the, yeah. the yeah, I don't even I don't think it was a hotel. I think it was like just the jackass offices. But mm -hmm. uh, it was a little hallway with like a bunch of uh, Hazers like, and like stuff. stun guns dangling, like cattle prods dangling, and it was just like I didn't want to do it, man. Like yeah. my my uh, you know my instincts really wanted me to not do that. And I remember saying like I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I have so much anxiety, but like uh, but I, I I muscled through it. Ripped over there and did it. Yeah, it's like um. Yeah, I, I was gung ho. And the other thing too about like being creative, like I don't think that there was one single idea I wrote for Jackass number two that even got filmed. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, I was a mess, dude. Like I, I was like, dude, I'll get a tattoo of a cigarette coming out of my lips with smoke rising up in my face. Thank <laughs> like God, that would right. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was one <laughs> of the ideas I submitted. dodged a bullet on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, I just didn't have, and I wasn't particularly brave, as loaded as I was on Jackass number two. Like, I wimped out on hella shit. It seems like you were, like, a big um, sniffing poop, sn like, definitely, yeah, all, yeah, you always the guy throwing up. Yeah, it was me, always a thing. Did you ever yeah. catch heat for that? Because 11-year-old <laughs> Taylor thought that was soft. I don't now. I'm oh, 32. wow. But 11-year-old Taylor was like, yo, this guy's always throwing up. What's the deal? Why is his stomach always like this? You never caught any heat for that? Oh, like soft because... Uh, soft like like uh, you're like... Nah. You're, you, get, you, get the, you get that weak stomach for sense and... Yeah, oh, uh, man. I never, it never occurred to me that, uh, that 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 was... I mean, maybe if like that's my go-to instead of gnarly, like stand in front of a bull, like I get that being soft. But soft because... No, nah, like it, what, what it was is... is um, just uh, having a, a really um, vivid and powerful imagination such that uh, I'm a terrible premature ejaculator if I find something sexy. And if I find something gross, like... It's just like uh, that. Yeah. Like, uh, all I need is just the the idea of something being gross. And I'm basically already barfing. Growing up. Yeah. Less Man. so less so in um, recent years than, than in the past. But yeah, that's just what it was. Like, uh, I never felt soft because I was such a hair trigger on barfing. Yeah, I get. And, I mean, and, I get and it. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely resentful at the Guinness Book of World Records for not acknowledging my undeniable world record for having barfed on screen in both television and film far more than anybody. They haven't recognized you at all. No, they've snubbed me year after year, and I'm sick of it. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> it's time. I know. I mean, dude, like, it, it could not be more demonstrable. Mm. Every time somebody barfs in television or film, it is so obviously fake. They put something in their mouth, and they just spit it. And when I barf on television and film, it is clearly real. And nobody has come near 
I mean, retroactively, I really demand justice. I, I, I think <laughs> this is the platform that for that to happen. Yeah. Our people will definitely say something. Yeah. They yeah, will definitely I get justice, after that. I'm not even asking a lot. I could, I could, I could have a scroll with a hundred world records, mm. but I'm, I'm only going for the, the most absolutely rock solid, demonstrable, and undeniable, and impressive world record. Mm -hmm. Maybe throw like, your piece also being my on a big piece. screen. No, your piece. Oh, your, my your genitalia. Piece. No, that's Pawnee's. He's got me so? by a mile. I thought he always had a nice little elephant wrapped around or something like nah. that, a nice little banana hammock. Nah. Pawnee's has got you on that? I think Pawnee's. I mean, especially after Jack I was four with that opening sequence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. I think that that was... I was like, what are they doing? Is that might have done a little bit more harm than good, though, because I think a lot of... A lot the of... Algorithm. A lot of, a lot of males are uh, not quite as comfortable with their sexuality as we are. Mm -hmm. And you hit them with that much dong that quick, <laughs> a lot of males are going to kind of like... So uh, I think you look at it and you just, you're just you sitting there wondering what the fuck's going on. Like, why is there a military? And then you see the penis and you're like, <laughs> we're fucking back, boys. <laughs> Ten years. Right. Jackass is back. Like, the fans are like, yes. I, I need a good piece in our life. I view it more as like kind of like uh, hucking a stick at a bunch of seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them are flying away. Yeah, a lot of them. A couple say those. See, hey, what's this, what's this thing going on? Yeah. What's going on around here? Right. You uh, you said in Jackass Two, you didn't. All the things you did right didn't happen. Jackass Three, creatively, how, well, how involved were you? I wrote the you? fuck out of Jackass. Yeah, hell yeah. Three. Yeah. How, how, how much pride did you take in that? I loved it, man. I loved it because um, number one. <laughs> Uh, I was able to like sit down in a in a writing session with Knoxville, you know, because th like the sober version. I was about two years sober at that time, and already like my relationships with the other jackass guys were just a lot more. They benefited from a lot, like like yeah. me wasted on coke and blah, blah, blah. like it was just like it was just too much. Nobody. To say people could only handle me in small doses is putting it mildly, you know. Yeah, so yeah. it was a uh, it, it it really really helped all of my relationships to to be sober and accountable and and like you know kind of focused. And so I would sit down with Knoxville and and uh, you know and all the guys and and, just, and and write ideas. I remember like. The cover of uh, the three point five DVD with the the Mentos and soda war. Yeah, I, I came up with that one. Like, um, I just I don't know. I, I wrote a lot of ideas that uh, that that all happened. You know, one thing you guys did that was like a genius idea going from three to four is introducing new members. Like that has given you guys the ability to allow that to kind of live on past what you're after you're done doing this tour. You say you'll do this and one more, and then after that, you don't know. Yeah, you seem like as I'm presenting that question to you, that there's some mixed reviews on how you feel about that. I don't know that everybody, uh, you know, it, it, the, I don't know that everybody felt that the the new cast w was a hit. I know that that the the OG cast, when the idea of bringing in new blood, younger, fresher faces. Um, like, one hundred percent of the OG cast was not stoked about that. Yeah, you know, like telling a bunch of attention whores that now they're going to share the share the stage with younger guys who are willing yeah. to do whatever they can on a platform that's already established. Right. Um, and and that was just a uh, something that they felt super duper strongly about. Who's that when we say that? Like the powers that be being Knoxville, Jeff Tremaine, and Spike Jones. Mm -hmm. Those guys are the three creators. Yeah. The, the the powers that be. And I get it. I think that they were they were right, you know. Um we needed uh some some help lifting, <laughs> you know, like yeah. um I think that if I'm conflicted about it um, the idea of, I mean, I just, for me, like my biggest fear in the world is like to be famous and broke, Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, I'm not by any means like, uh, trying, trying to be judgmental or, or, or negative. I just, 
I'm very sensitive to the idea of um, giving, putting people on a, a, a on a platform like that and giving them, you know, and, and they're just not, not being compensated. You yeah. know? So you're making them like principal cast members in a bona fide, like maybe not blockbuster, but legit Hollywood franchise. Yeah, a huge fan base, people that are going huge to see it, you base. know it's going to make money. Right. And like, and, and their compensation isn't there, mm. you know? So like, then add on top of that, that uh, you've been writing their ideas for them, you know, like, it, like are, are, do we know that they have the, the ability to manage that level of opportunity that you're handing them, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it's just, it's just, it, you know, it, you know, like it's a really, really dark way to, to put it. But like, uh, I sure wasn't a fan of that bum fights thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It it is like it seems like a like a long play is. I, I already feel there. bad for saying that. No, you, you just, <laughs> because speaking just talking about a fear that's crossing through your mind is nothing. Yeah, I mean, you know. like I do. I love I love the new guys, and with that said, like I have that sensitivity, and I've done like everything that I can to try to help them. You know, yeah. like with uh, like developing YouTube videos, like ideas, like merch designs like websites mm -hmm. like uh you know because you have a big reign on all of that you've, you've you do a great job and take every opportunity to promote all that stuff which is what you got to do yeah with these how long after when you heard i don't know who told you if you if you even want to say hey we're going to add new blood to this cast how long did that resistance go to cooperation um <laughs> resistance was futile yeah because it was gonna happen it was gonna whether, happen but whether we uh, liked how long it were not. you like mad about it until you're like all right i this... mean nobody was gonna turn down a movie deal mm -hmm. and like uh so everybody was in and there was gonna be a new cast mm -hmm. so uh whether we liked it or not it was uh gonna happen and i would say that that the the sentiment changed just on the very first day of filming like mm. uh like the um you know all the new cast members just brought good energy they were just so visibly stoked to be there like it was impossible as much as we wanted to not like them yeah. it was impossible to not love them right away and uh you know between all of us the the chemistry was you know it's like we never stopped shooting like uh you know, the laughs were there. The, the energy was there for sure. Mm. How much did you feel the absence of Bam Margera during that whole thing? Um, I mean, he was there uh, for the first week. Like, we, we, we managed to film for one week. He was only there at the tail end of that week. I think he shot maybe, like, two days. Um... And then at the end, he shot the last two days of the first week, and then the pandemic shut everything down. Yeah. So we went into uh, hiatus from March all the way through October, which is like, what, like six months or something. And um, Bam had these stipulations that he wasn't allowed to get loaded, but like, I don't think that was going to happen anyway, but it definitely wasn't going to happen like being on hold for six months, right. you know? Um, and, and, uh, like when he was there for those two days, like to me, it, it didn't really feel like, like bam, as we knew him, yeah. you know, like it was, it was a little bit of a shell of, of, uh, bam. Um, and then like during those six months of pandemic, when, he was fired uh i was the one more than anybody campaigning to try to get him back on the movie mm -hmm. i was like guys like the the answer here i don't think is to scrub him entirely 
you know, like the, I think the rationale for firing him entirely was that like he was a liability and that if he had some disaster, it was going to reflect poorly on the movie and, and the franchise. But I'm like, guys, let's be realistic, you know, like you, you can't make a family member not your relative, you know, like if whether he's fired, 100 percent fired from the movie or not, you are not going to mitigate his attachment or affiliation. Can't pretend like he never existed the, or something. We can't pretend like he never existed. Yeah. And like, yes, by all means, penalize him for for uh, you know breaching his agreement with the uh, sobriety, but don't remove don't remove him completely. Just uh, you know have like a a, a lesser role like uh, reduce his involvement reduce his compensation mm -hmm. but don't entirely remove him because if you do that then when we get into promoting the film like we're not even going to be able to promote the film because the, we're going to be dealing with questions oh well bam bam you know like yeah. if, if if you if you reduce his involvement if you reduce his compensation and anybody says anything about bam it's like oh well no, he is in the movie. Like, next question. Yeah. You know, like, and then the other level of, like, dude, what are we doing to uh, just imagine, like, I mean, I remember how awful and how traumatized I was by the bad grandpa situation where I felt like the Jackson 4. Yeah. And that was me along with everybody else in the cast. Yeah. You know, and that's how much it traumatized me. And, and it wasn't even... A jackass movie. Yeah. Like now. So you're not projecting those same fears, being like, Bam's probably going to feel this way and go now, through that. Yeah. Now imagine what what we're doing to Bam by singling him out, and he's mm. the only one. Now, like, he's Dave Mustaine, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. kicked out of Metallica. Yeah. You know, like, um, that that that's a, a heavy and gnarly thing, and, and I wasn't, you know, trying to project or but but like heaven forbid anything really gnarly happens like and and we did that mm -hmm. you know like so so me the sober nerd i was the biggest like most outspoken person campaigning on bam's behalf to get him back in the movie yeah i was trying my ass off like i was like I was scripting texts for him to send to the powers that for Bam be, to try to put the appropriate words in his mouth to sway their opinion. No way. You no, know, I was like, yeah, I was doing everything that that I could, and and it just was, you know, and and like it got to a point where we had um like a, a Zoom meeting, you know, there was like between Knoxville and Jeff Tremaine and Spike Jones, there was like. Like almost like a like a, a podium, like bronze, silver, gold, like different levels of okay, you know, like yeah. resistance. You get the okay from here, you go to the next different, one, you go to the next different one. Different levels of resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bam back on. We got to a point where all three of them were gonna have a Zoom call with Bam, and it was it was like almost just a formality of like, okay, we're gonna give you another chance. You're coming back in. Right. And and that Zoom call, like. Bam, that's the nature of alcoholism. You find the worst possible time to blow everything because he he no-showed that Zoom call. No. After appearing all over social media, just visibly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Like, there was no question about where he'd been the night before or yeah. what shape he was in, mm -hmm. and he did not make it onto that call, and that was that the, the purpose of that call was to be like, okay, you're back. And he blew it. No way. After yeah. you put all that work in of scripting those texts I mean, it's and not everything. Like I did it all by myself. No, no doubt. But, but I you was were a, putting all that work in from just from watching I, from I was, your I angle. Was, I, I was pushing for it, man. I didn't think it did the franchise any good to make it a big thing about firing him. And and the powers that be felt that uh that and they're not wrong. They felt that the reason why Bam has 
like progressed so far in his illness is because he's never had any consequences. Mm -hmm. He's always had everybody shield him from his consequences and, you know, everything's been okay. And for the first time, they were going to, like, put some teeth in what they said. Yeah. And then they're not wrong. They're not wrong, but it's just a high stakes game. It goes back to the enabling. And then, but yeah. it also not only you stop enabling, bam, but now you're putting a whole bunch more on your y'all's plate when you're promoting this movie. And the same thing happens you just said, or where's bam, what's going on, bam. You don't want that to be the main storyline of Jack S4. Right. I mean, and, and, be... uh, and, and it, it, it was like when, when, like, Every other week or whatever it was that there's a new TMZ thing and they're interviewing yeah. Bam. And he's like, oh, and then Bam sues him. Like that was the most absurd lawsuit. I remember talking to Bam because I was I was talking I was I was like Switzerland in the whole deal the whole time. You yeah. know, I was the one guy that that Which uh, is so wild too being the most sober guy there. <laughs> yeah, You're like hey. This drug addict, we got to keep this guy fucking in here, man. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And, and I remember when the lawsuit thing came up and I was like, bam, you know, I'll tell you what, dude. Like, go for the bag, you know, by all means. Like, go for the bag, but but separate. And I said, too, I said, if you can actually manage to get anything out of suing, my hat is off to you because you, sir, have no case whatsoever. <laughs> like... This is like everything that's wrong about the 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 civil like l lawsuit like society that we live in mm. where it is like it is no brainer to throw money at it to just avoid legal costs. Yeah. Because I, like his case was pure bullshit. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. like demonstrably false. Yeah. Like, it was so meritless and so factually incorrect, everything that he was claiming, mm -hmm. that I cannot believe he even managed to get a, any kind of a settlement. I can't even believe that it wasn't just dismissed with prejudice, like, That's out of the gate. That's so, nuts. Yeah, he I, probably did. He sat there and he was like, they'll, they'll see, man. When I take this franchise down... Yeah, <laughs> I mean... You have nothing, brother. He got, like, he got a chunk of change. And uh, it wasn't, like, a particularly impressive chunk of change. Yeah. And and I, as I understand it, like, a whopping percentage, like, above what's normal went to the lawyers. And then, like, what, what remained, the stupid asshole turned around and bought, like, a Bentley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you dumbass. Why did you, you know, like oh my that's God. the scariest thing when when you have like this uh this 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 need, this like ego driven need to like keep up appearances. Mm -hmm. Like how many like when 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 you're trying to keep up the appearance and you can't really like you don't have it like that, but you're but it's really important to pretend that you do. Mm -hmm. Then you're in a really scary place. I come from that world with football, sports, athletes yeah. in general, man. Did you like see the documentary broke. God, that's you talk about biggest fears. Yeah. You know, I stare down that barrel every day and I'm like, please, God, do not let that happen to me. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason. But you see guys who come play in the league, they're a rookie, they're that's undrafted, right. they're making some, like a small amount of money for the for NFL, and they're pulling up in the Bentleys. They're pulling wow. up in the, the Maybacks and all that stuff. You're like, dude, you don't need to do this. Right. I think that they've like brought in uh some kind of like regulatory system where you have to like have some kind of financial education. Yeah, I I mean not with the NFL. I think with all of this all NIL stuff, and I don't know how much you know about that, but like yeah. the college players who now use their likeness, and there needs to be some. This kid from USC, Caleb Williams, he's making three million dollars this year as a college athlete, and there needs to be something put into put in there where it's like this is how you. Diversify your portfolio. This is where you handle this. Like, give them the basics. Well, okay. Like, that, like we don't need to totally uh, get sidetracked here. But if you're only a college athlete, presumably you're early enough in your career, and you're if you're making that kind of money as a college athlete, it's probably a pretty safe bet that you're going to go pro. So you can do what LeBron did, where you, you learn from your mistakes early, mm. and then by the time you you're in the pros, you've already had your growing pains. And that's a phenomenal point. However, he's not LeBron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 
you kind of sit there and you're like, <clears throat> he goes out, and I hope this does not happen, gets injured. Career-ending injury, right. something happens. That $3 million dollars is all you got now. Because sure. NFL, the average in the NFL is two years. And if you're and everything's is that slated, really the average, the average or... NFL player plays for two years, and you don't, and eighty percent of them go broke. Oh, five dude. years, and the NBA is even crazier. Even crazier, and that money's even bigger than the NFL. So you get this kid who has three million dollars. I would just say put him in a situation where he knows the basics. Do the sure. do the three dollar rule. One dollar goes to At paying least... taxes. One dollar goes to your house. One dollar goes to what you want. You're good. Make him watch Billy Corbin's documentary entitled Broke. Yes. <laughs> like it's 100%. So it's it, it's so a scary heavy. thing, especially because football is such a, a wild world where dudes come from all over different sure. demographics and everything. For sure. Guys are more educated in other spaces. So it is one of those deals where yeah. I hope it all works out, but you need to give these guys a little bit of guidance. If you would have gave me $3 million in college, first off, half of it would have gone up my nose oh, and I would have been fucking going <laughs> crazy. Yeah, I, I would. Pro I probably would have died. I would, there was no way I would have been able to handle that situation. Yeah. But yeah, we did get a little sidetracked. This is not about me or football. Yeah, it's all good. And I mean, like at the end of the day, uh, it's just really scary what what's going on. Like, I, I I'm not saying that the powers that be did anything wrong. I mm -hmm. like uh, they, their their heart was in the right place. And for all of Bam's crazy accusations about how they screwed me and this, like, uh, like nobody has and unilaterally not one person has wanted anything for bam but the best for him yeah be happy and healthy mm -hmm. and everybody's got a different approach to how they think that they're going to help bam become happy and healthy and uh not one of these people can do shit because it's up to bam yeah it is it's one of those things you got you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink. Yeah. Um one person you've brought up a lot in this and I have basically started the show with giving flowers to Johnny Knoxville. Where do you think this franchise would be if it wasn't for Johnny? Cuz you hear about the MTV and he says, "Well, fuck you guys. I'm not losing the integrity of the show." Right. And gets you guys a movie deal and essentially turns Jackass into what it is today like how pivotal was that man in this whole entire process? Oh, 100%. That's why I call him the captain. Yeah. You know, I, I really, really revere him. And, uh, you know, as the, the, you know, Johnny Knoxville and Jeff Tremaine and Spike Jones, it's really like the dynamic for me. Like Johnny Knoxville is like the older brother who can do no wrong. Like he's just like the older brother that, that you worship and you want to like, you know, you just look up to him, mm -hmm. you know? And Jeff Tremaine is, like, the father figure who you just want to make proud, like, you know, like, the most important thing is to, like, make him proud. And then Spike Jones is, like, you know, it's embarrassing to say, but, like, he's got this, like, deity, quite, you know? Yeah. Like, he's, like, beyond father. He's, like, like got a holiness to him, mm -hmm. you know? Where, like, like, all three of them put together are absolutely the three people who it means the most to me to uh try to impress you know like praise from them I means so, like all three of them are like incredibly receptive to uh and supportive of every little youtube video like mm. book like comedy special everything that i do uh they hear about like i'm pretty persistent like uh with you know sharing my press yeah he had 49 <laughs> articles coming off uh the apple yeah, tower but you know and um they've just all been so supportive of me and um i think that uh you know i think that i can comfortably say that they're all like quite impressed with what i've managed to accomplish and i'm profoundly grateful for that that's awesome man. that is, that's incredible um do we want to hear hit some tear talk with mr steve-o Cool, let me take a leak, and yeah, that's the perfect time. Um, so uh, we do segments on our show, and it's one of them is called Tear Talk. And as you're in the bathroom, we were talking about what we should do for Tear Talk. I feel like the best thing to do is um, best character stunts. And you're going to give us your top three. Okay. Throughout all the Jackass movies, all the stuff. Could have been something that, like, didn't make the cut. Dude, I... Um, but you got to start at three. Okay, I made a YouTube video at one point called uh, my top 10 favorite jackass bits, which I was not in. Yeah. And 
it got a strike for my channel on YouTube. Hell yes. Because it didn't occur to me that there would be a problem with me saying, uh, let me show you what wasn't allowed on Jackass. Yeah. You know, like, um, I went and, uh, showed some stuff that, you know what I mean? By, by the virtue of me saying this was not allowed on TV, mm -hmm. Like, it's like, well, then why the fuck would it be allowed on YouTube? You know, like, yeah. and so, yeah, I caught a strike for that. Um, but, yeah, if I, 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 Dan, am I going with per cast member? I think you can do whatever you want. I mean, My thought is your top three of, like, whoever it could be you, could be somebody else. Top three stunts. Okay, um, with, uh... With Jackass, there's, like, very distinct lanes, you know? There's, like, painful. There's dangerous. There's gross. And there's, like, just the sort of uh, absurd, you know? Like, yeah. um, and uh, I think it's been very masterful, like, how... Uh, you know, you can't stay in one lane for too long. Yeah. You gotta change, you know, like just the 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 strategic order, you know, and like whatever's like super gross, like mm. they, you know, would on the TV show particularly, like uh make that the final bit. Yeah. Because you know you're gonna lose a lot of the female audience if it's so gross. Yeah. You know, so there's like a lot of strategy. And I I I mentioned that because what I thought was so genius. I mean, yeah, I would have landed in the prank lane, you know, like it's a lane is in pranks, but it was just so unique and, and uh, unsung was Knoxville's taxidermy bit. There was a hidden camera prank where Knoxville went into a number of uh, taxidermy businesses with this elderly woman who he named Dottie, Dorothy. And Dorothy's supposed to be like 90 years old and she looks every bit of it. And Knoxville goes in and, and you know, the, the taxidermy, all the animals are all over the place. And he says, hey, this is my grandma, uh, Dottie. And, uh, you know, sadly, she doesn't have much longer with us. And we're just here to inquire um, if she could be stuffed and mounted. <laughs> like, can you stuff and mount my grandma who's standing right next to me? Oh my God. Like, and, and can you, and, and it just, it was just so genius, man. And like, uh, you know, one place said, like, I don't even think that would be legal but yeah. uh you know <laughs> yeah. but but uh, definitely I, I don't even know how we would cure the skin <laughs> like Ooh, all he's this, going like, into it yeah it's going into it like then and and then there was he actually got a quote he actually got a quote they, they're like i don't know like off the record i think like 20 g's and like, <laughs> she's like you know it's like she's standing right there like the, to me that was the most genius like genius bit yeah like uh and it was just like everything in the lanes, like all kind of like if you stay in one lane too long, everything starts feeling like very similar. Mm -hmm. And like there's no number of pranks you could put back to back where that wouldn't stand out as like that is so funny, as genius and unique. Like, uh, so I, I think taxidermy is up there. Um, Certainly for the prank. I mean, the, the, there were some good ass pranks, like the 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 all the uh, fake baby ones were yeah. were really good. And, and credit to Dave England for uh, starting off the, the the fake baby phenomena. You know, he started it with uh, Daddy and Baby, and the fake baby was on the 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 bicycle seat on the back, and he would mm. crash the bicycle. And then they just kind of took that and ran with it. They did a million fake baby ones. But as good as they were, they weren't just like, man, that taxidermy. I think that's my favorite prank of all time. Uh, as far as, like, the, the stunts, 
I mean, Dave England, man. I'm I'm gonna give Dave England credit for being just so goddamn creative, man. Like he always just, he just thinks in a way that other people don't think. Um, he had like skateboarding in like a rolling, you know, full pipe that's going down the hill, like rollerblading on a skate. Like uh, he just just this quirky stuff, you know. Um, Love all that. And then Knoxville's, of course, the gnarliest. Not everything Knoxville always did because Knoxville's the one guy who didn't grow up skateboarding. Mm -hmm. So we all grew up skateboarding for the most part, which means we'd spent our, like, all of our growing up, like, learning how to fall down. Mm -hmm. You know, you fall off a skateboard, you kind of figure out, like, how to land. Knoxville had none of that. So whenever Knoxville falls, he has no idea how to land, and it's the worst, most devastating slam. Some of those bulls, man. That's, That's why Knoxville I consider to be the most exciting professional skateboarder in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and with the bulls, man. Like I don't know, like uh, like I said it in the fourth Jackass movie. Like at no point, even when life was worth the least to me. Yeah. When I valued my own life the least, you couldn't get me in front of a goddamn bull. <laughs> was, yeah. Why? Why was he doing that? Why did he go and get on the bull? Because he's he's done it before. I mean, he literally said, "There's only a finite more of concussions you can take, brother." Right. And it's over. Yeah, I and think we're finally the most fine. gnarly hit ever. Yeah, I think he's finally done with being in front of bulls. Thank God. Yeah. And and I you know I don't know I just say like he's just a different breed, man. He's uh. He's a different breed of dude. And, and um, I just don't understand it. Like, if you think about, like, Jackass was just, like, lightning in a bottle for so many reasons. Like, uh, how, like, just from a insurance standpoint, like, I'm not even clear that the first movie was insured. Really? You know? like... I mean, I'm sure it was on some level, but but there's this thing in Hollywood called a negative pickup, which means that a movie studio might fund the movie, but they're not, like, attached to it in any formal way. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, that was how the first Jackass movie was made, was like, okay, like, $5 million, like... And, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm not like being very accurate, but like my general understanding is that like five million dollars was shuttled to a ghost company, like perhaps in some untraceable man, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, and the 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 ghost company like produces the film, and you know the first film like it wraps, nobody's dead. And then in a very formal sense, Paramount Pictures, the movie studio, finds out about this existing movie for the first time. They say, oh, wow, this is great. We're just finding out about this movie now. We would like to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's a negative pickup, meaning they purchase it after it's been filmed. And, uh, you know, liability reasons. Yeah, I think now you would have to talk to an entertainment lawyer to find out if anything that I just said is even remotely true. But uh, you strap on the word allegedly to the back yeah, half of that. And I you're mean, good. Strap allegedly to that whole yeah. theory. There you go. But, uh, but yeah, it's like that's just the level of um, of liability. Now, certainly like the, the last movies were like you know, like insurance crazy. Like, you know, they, they really did the last movies like, uh, like I believe very differently from that. But regardless, when you're dealing with insuring a movie, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, your leading man in your major like theatrical box office production, like not only does Knoxville not have a stunt double, mm -hmm. He's the one taking the biggest risks. Yeah. It's like taking Tom Brady and like, you know, putting him like in, in the most 
No, no line. Like, you okay, yeah. Tom, you know, you're gonna go out there. We're just gonna. You're not gonna have an offensive line for this game. Right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and rip it, brother. See what happens. Just, just uh, go out NFL's there. Biggest asset. Yeah. Hey, nobody needs no snap. Yeah. Um, you're just gonna just start holding the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like. Uh, I mean, it's crazy, dude. It's that, I mean, unprecedented. It's unprecedented to have a leading man in a Hollywood movie, like, take risks like that. Uh, it, it, like, it, it, it goes on and on and on about how just lightning in a bottle it is. And um, like nothing like that ever happened before. And nothing like that, I don't think, could ever happen again. Now, sure, I got to acknowledge that with, with the action sports... There's risks being taken, mm-hmm. like like people are dying, like on a fairly regular basis. Like somebody should look at the action sports industry and and really question, like what's going on over here? You know, it's a wild, it's a wild industry. Travis Pastrana, who like seems like he just is the king of all that, right? And all those guys. There's been so many dudes in that Nitro Circus world that's unfortunately right. passed away. Yeah, it's really really scary. Mm-hmm. And uh, in order to be like relevant or, or, you know, like you have to, it's like this goddamn movie on Netflix, the, the deepest breath where these chicks are, are competing for who can free dive on one breath the farthest. And I've like, they have, they have to break the record every time. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're literally like at 103 meters below the water on one single breath. And for the their record to count, for their dive to count, they have to re-emerge conscious. <laughs> oh, no way. And it doesn't even count when they're like, yeah. they're like me passing out on nitrous oxide when they get to the water. It's the most disturbing, shocking, fucking upsetting thing. And they have to be conscious and they have to be able to, to look at the judge and be like, I'm okay. Oh my God. And then they get the white card. You win. Like, dude, people are dying. Is like, a show on Netflix? It's, 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 a, it's a documentary film. Oh my God. And then as soon as it ends, the one that, that they that pops up is the trailer for the next thing they feed you is like the fucking free diving documentary about the assholes who go through the hole in the ice and they have to make it to the other hole that's like <laughs> And live. Now they're yeah, now they're 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 hypothermia plus fucking like no like free no breathing. Free no breathing. <laughs> But I mean, dude, like that the world we live in is it's just really, really crazy. That, and like where that example gives me no doubt that this is gonna be on Netflix. You're special. Oh, I don't know about that. I, I don't it, know. I don't know. It is it is Chappelle meets uh pr- like stunts. It's it I, uh, really is that good. Like that that seven minutes where you're able to show us. Well, oh, thank you, man. You went to the bathroom, we we said they're like we would all watch that. It, it's it's I'm gonna tell you it's goddamn good. Like uh, I I worked on that show for five fucking years, man, and uh, like I never stopped like improving it. Like that's awesome. It, it uh yeah and then thank you. I, I would love it if if it got on Netflix, and I'd uh, especially love it if uh, you know <laughs> the stupid writers and SAG strike that I don't understand yeah, helped I, that to be the case. I'm not as I'm not as familiar with all that, but it does seem like a bit of a deal out here in Hollywood. Before we get out of here, we got obviously most of the boys, if not all the boys are Jack and Spence. Do you guys have any questions for Mr. Steve O? Jackie Garrett. Is there one from the original show, the TV show, one stunt that just stands out above the rest? Taxidermy was on the TV that was the show. show? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing about the TV show, Jackass, when it came out, like, um, the whole cast was never in one place together until we were filming the second season. So we were all, like, bona fide stars on MTV, and that really, like, meant something back then because that was at a time, year 2000, when it came out, and it was, it was the world of dial-up modems, you know? Like, there was no such thing as playing video footage on the internet. Mm-hmm. 
like in any like real way. So you had no competition um, from the internet for television. And, and, and what that meant, like the media was just not fragmented the way that it is today. Like, and on top of that, when Jackass came out, it was instantly the highest rated, biggest profit margin that MTV had ever had. And it was, it was soon dethroned by the Osbournes a year or two later. Um, but like, it had a staggering audience and it made us all like, legitimate celebrities overnight and we hadn't even met each other so like when, when when each episode came on i had absolutely no idea what i was gonna see except for i knew what i was gonna have on the show you know maybe like i filmed the whole first season of of the jackass tv show in the space of five days, even though I only filmed on three of those days. And uh, so I, I was privy to what I was there for when it happened in those five days, but Bam wasn't there when I was shooting. Like, uh, none of the CKY crew, Dave Van Glenn, Preston Lacey, Wee Man, like, so everything was as new to me when I was watching that first season when it premiered as it was to every one of the other millions of people that was watching yeah. And I remember just being like, just so impressed. I was just like, especially because when the show got picked up, I um, was told like to send in all the video footage that I had so that it could be licensed, acquired, and, and included in the show, just like a lot of BAM's CKY footage was. But when I sent in all the video footage that I had, they told me that not one clip I sent them was allowed on television. <laughs> Because MTV was super touchy about fire, you know, because they had like fire lawsuits that were really, really, uh, you know, costly to them. And they had rules over like if you were going to jump off something, it couldn't be over a certain height. And that was my thing was jumping off high shit, like and lighting myself on fire and sometimes both at the same time, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and if I wasn't lighting myself on fire or jumping off high shit, then I was like compensating for that by making it really gnarly and yeah. by definition not allowed on MTV. So my first concern before we even started filming the series was, yeah, it's great that Big Brother minus the skateboarding is going to be on MTV, but what kind of a watered-down, pussified version of it is it going to be like? What are they even going to let us do? Like, I stand in all my footage and nothing's allowed on TV. And then when the episodes came on, I was like, oh, okay. All right, like they really got very nimble at like working within the the the, the rules, the, the the confines of you know, like. And I just remember being like, "God damn, I'm part of something cool!" Like, fly. like I was just like a fan of the show and on the show, mm -hmm. you know. So like, when you say, "What was my favorite bit from the TV show?" Like, I remember like. Mexican snowboarding or whatever, like, uh, you know, which probably wouldn't fly today. <laughs> you know, uh, just everything was so goddamn rad. And, and how uh, Knoxville had, like, uh, his broken ankle for the whole, like, they just, like, it just felt like, uh, particularly with Knoxville's broken ankle, um, it felt like... Uh, Conti like a continuous stream, you know? And, like, the failures, like, making the cut. And it's like, oh, yeah, like, just taking failure in stride. Like, probably the most impressed I was, like, when Knoxville actually broke his ankle. You got Pontius dressed up as Bunny the lifeguard. And uh, and Knoxville does the the thing, breaks his ankle, and, and Pontius is like, it's like Johnny Knoxville. Best rollerblader, or best roller skater in the the whole, best roller skater in the world, maybe in the whole town. You know, something like just like <laughs> just shit like that that Pontius would say. It was so so funny, like and 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 even more so with Brandon D. Camillo, who is who is uh, everything everything that ever came out of Brandon D. Camillo's mouth is my favorite. Of, of everything. Like, he was more talented than 
all of us put together. I would, I would like, if not all of us, like damn near all of us put together. That's, and I was seething with jealousy, just like with D. Camillo and Pontius, how they didn't have to risk anything. They didn't have to, they didn't have to have any like physicality. They didn't have to be in any pain. They didn't have to take any risks. They could just make nothing into gold. Mm. You know, like they're just, damn, there's those two guys just, they're not like natural talent never came to me <laughs> you know like it like my attention seeking like was all you know i'm like pure hustle you know pure hustle grinding for that next thing when you were doing uh the se first season and you don't know any of these guys in the second season you guys are all put together who were you most excited to meet at that point like and who did you gravitate towards the, the fastest uh i mean this is the interesting part is that like that first season like I, my uh, total money earned was after taxes less than fifteen hundred dollars. No shit for the entire season. A lot of and, risk, no reward. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. And, and uh, I mean, like, like uh, I made a YouTube video called "Why I Was Broke When Jackass Started" or whatever. Like that, that gets all into that. But um, but I was working in a circus at a flea market when it started, and uh, I told those circus owners that when uh, that, that there was going to be an MTV crew coming, that I was going to be famous, that I had to go film for five days, but that I would be back. And, uh, and just like I said, on precisely the day I said, the MTV crew came and the circus owners were like very, very touchy because there were animal rights people crawling all over the place because they had three elephants. Mm -hmm. And and like they ended up getting shut down like for the like animal stuff. But like when the MTV crew came in Knoxville and, and Tremaine and, and, and the circus owner says like, why are these assholes here filming my elephants? You know, like that's just the hot button thing you do not do. And, and I said, like, I told you that they were going to come and it's MTV. They're not going to like give you a, you know, they're not going like, to do anything where you can sue them. And that was just too much. And when I came back from the five days of filming, having been bitten by a shark, like just, just completely sleep deprived, drinking all night, like just... I come in to the circus and they're like, man, we don't have it in the budget. Like, uh, we gotta let you go. And it was 100% because the elephants been filmed. But now I'm unemployed. And I'm, and now I'm unemployed. And I'm a cocaine addict. And I don't have any money. And my sister kicks me out of the house. I'm living with my sisters. Now I'm homeless. And then, like, the show comes out. And I'm broke, unemployed, homeless, cocaine addicted. And, like a star on the biggest show in the history of MTV. No fucking way. Like, can I have a photo with you? Yeah. Can I sleep on your sofa? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I mean, that's what it was like. So I had nothing. I, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was homeless. And I was on drugs. And I was in, like, and, uh, and dude, Bam had everything. He had built-in revenue streams. He was selling more skateboards than Tony Hawk. Bam Margera holds the world record for selling more skateboards than any human that's ever lived. No shit. And I believe that it's like to an exponential, like to the power of like three or ten or something, Still more more than Tony Hawk. Yeah. I don't think anybody will ever catch up to Bam Margera for having sold the most skateboards. I think that's a bona fide, legit. Are you Googling it? Dude, 100%. It's going to come up right now. That Like, he sold more fucking skateboards than anybody in history. He was out selling Tony Hawk, like, by a lot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as soon as Jackass came out. He was in, then he was in the Jackass, or he was in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Mm -hmm. And that money coming in from that was outrageous. Like, and he had his shoes... He had money coming in from every direction that you could possibly face. I had Man. nothing. Homeless, <laughs> you know? homeless, and you're looking yeah. at one of your co-stars being like, "Dude, you literally have everything." Yeah, I mean, like, and and uh, I remember too because um, I think the show was already out, and um, I hadn't seen CKY2K, mm -hmm. and I saw, and I was like, my buddy's making a porno in his bedroom. He's literally filming himself, like, 
And uh, for his own personal collection, or is he, yeah, is he was, marketing he was, this? He's for his own personal yeah. home, home video. It's, good. it's always good to have those in the arsenal. Right. I'm a uh, like vagrant homeless. On a, you know, I'm watching CKYTK on a VHS tape, and and I. Well, by the way, we're all on liquid acid. Like we're literally put droplets of liquid acid in our mouths. We're tripping our faces off while he's filming himself in the bedroom. And I'm watching CKY2K, and I see Bam jump off of the sixth floor balcony into a swimming pool, and I'm just so jealous. Like he's like. It was, that was so rad. And I go and I demand my buddy, like, stop, come on, we got to go. I'm fucking, like, I, my response to seeing Bam jump off that balcony was to go get my clown stilts and video camera and throw myself off of a bridge while walking still. <laughs> like, over the railing and everything, so that as I go over the railing, like, I get, like, uh, kind of the rotation of it. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about, like, football and, and ACLs, dude. You want to go over the railing off a bridge while wearing stilts that are strapped to your knees? Like, your ACLs are in jeopardy. You know? And I'm on... toward those ACLs. Ne never. No way. My knees are solid, dude. I've never had knee I surgery. I'm jealous of those knees. Dude, I've I've uh, I've I've been big on stitches, big on broken bones, but my joints are are uh, solid. I'm getting, I've got maybe some hip issues and and rotator cuff in my shoulder, but it's like normal wear and tear, dude. What's the is that the shoulders and the hips are the number one things, one and two things that they're they're, they're the just most? creeping up super recent. Yeah, like uh, yeah, it's creeping up super recent. Do you do anything like NAD or anything like that? Haven't tried NAD, oh, but you gotta uh, do NAD. It is truly incredible. I, mean, I went to Columbia and got stem cells for degenerative disc disease in my neck. In your neck? I yeah, had a I, neck thing too. I had to get an epidural for it one time. Oh, dude! In my bucket list show, I got an epidural foot race. Epidural foot race? Well, yeah, and had like an epidural, like fifty yard dash. <laughs> 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 they pull out the needle out. It's a four inch needle in your spinal cavity. They in inject a drug called. Uh, chloroprocaine into my spinal cavity, mm -hmm. which renders me paralyzed while I'm in a full sprint. They pull out the needle and go. Which I'm is like, literally when you said in Jack S3 and 4, you're like, if these two things don't happen, be yeah, paralyzed or dead. Right. Oh, dude. Like, yeah. Like, I, I did life threatening ass shit in, in the bucket list. Well. How'd you make the 50 yards? Uh, dude, I kept it like, uh, it, I was in this bath. Yeah. yeah. Well, dude, the, the craziest, darkest thing about that is, like, once I'm down, they got to determine how paralyzed I really am. <laughs> how do they do that? Like, flick your like, toes? You feel this? Oh, no, they did like... a lot more than flick my toes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got, we're running out of tape. Um, do you guys don't have any questions? I, yeah, I think I got to get going anyway. Okay. I sold them 10 times over. Ten times Tony Ten Hawk. Ten times Tony Hawk. Can you imagine how many skateboards? Tony Hawk's been the number one in since the '80s. Bam strolls along in 2000, and since then has sold ten times the skateboards of Tony Hawk. And like, I mean, dude, I I can't even. Like, you, you can never t trust uh, celebrity net worth. Like, they're so wrong. Like, it's just it's it's a joke. So, like, whatever they think Tony Hawk's worth, I'm guessing that's a rare instance where they're coming in low. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think most of the time it's like, you know, like chop it in half and you're closer. But I think they're coming in low on, on the bird, man. Dude, what a legend. We got to get him on the show sometime. Dude, I cannot okay, think you do enough. it, man. Tony's the coolest, raddest, like that'd be unreal honest like for being like the foremost icon in something that's like not even a subculture like a mainstream like olympic sport like you cannot like you got kelly slater for surfing you've got sean white for snowboarding you got tony hawk for skateboarding like these, these are like the undeniable like like coca-cola with no pepsi you know, yeah. Britney Spears with no Christina Aguilera. Yeah. Like, nobody's close to Tony Hawk in being the most famous skateboarder ever. And uh, he's the most down-to-earth dude will do, like, virtually, like, whatever you have to do, I'm down, for sure. His documentary on HBO was unreal. It was unreal. It was so cool to see. It was unreal. Yeah. And, uh, like, yeah, 100%. And, like, so inspiring, man. You know, like I, when I was loaded, I used to uh, look at 
Tommy Lee. Mm. And and I'd be like, as, if, as long as Tommy Lee's still raging, like I got another 10 years in me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then after I got sober, like I switched to like Tony Hawk. As long as Tony Hawk's getting rad, I got, <laughs> I got I got another six years in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? That's awesome, man. Dude, we can't thank you enough for yeah. opening your home to us. Dude, he's hanging out with us for as long as you did what hour. 45 hour Didn't 50 even give whatever you guys it is a hard time for stealing my uh podcasting on vehicle yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well dude you're welcome on anytime you want dude, to come back dude there's I, a whole I love lot more to break down i love it and let me send everybody to get my bucket list special like the mistivo.com is the hub for all of my great merch I got the wild ride podcast um books man two books and by the time this comes out like my second book will be available signed every copy i sign um yeah dude i love it uh you know i like to consider myself like i think to myself a lot of the time what would tony hawk do mm -hmm. like if i'm feeling like i'm gonna lash out at somebody publicly not tony tony and not kind of no, no way His twitter too very underrated oh, it's his twitter oh dude it hit like He'll go into like coffee shops and be like, You look like Tony yeah. Hawk. He goes, and Yeah, because I am. And yeah. they're like, Oh, that's hilarious. Here's your coffee. Yeah, he'll relate these experiences in a way that if anybody else did that, it would be like super douchey. Yeah. But like he's just like very realistic about what his life is like mm. and in an objective way that's not even remotely like grandiose or, or, or he's just like really, really good at being like an ambassador and an icon and like a, a fucking legend and just like not even thinking it's a big deal but like hey let me share let me share my experience in the coffee shop yeah you know it's epic dude i'm like i fucking love tony hawk man nothing better than one legend talking about another legend yeah. What a day. Please subscribe. Rate five stars. Steve WTHD, dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Thanks, everybody.